you can't separate education from politics. Edu- if we're saying education, the broader aspect of it is about citizenship and agency and doing something about something you feel is ultimately very, very wrong in the system. And if it's about making choices, if it's about collaboration, if, if education is about all of those sorts of things, then it's about politics. And if we take politics out of education, we are we are dumbing down, we are we are castrating a whole generation by making it seem like they 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 don't really have a part to play in these bigger decisions that are being taken on their behalf. And that's so so wrong. Welcome to Rethinking Education. Education's critical friend. Hello and welcome to episode 13 of the Rethinking Education podcast. Lucky for you. The last episode went down well, featuring my conversation with arch neo-traditionalist, or should that be arch explicit teacher, Adam Boxer. It was by far the most popular of all the episodes I've released so far. World domination is surely just around the corner. But it also stimulated lots of fascinating discussions and comments. Here are a few things people said on Twitter. Nick Wood wrote, When people say the prog trad debate is unhelpful, I'm often inclined to agree. Twitter discourse isn't great for understanding why it can be a productive lens. A podcast like this, however, gives insight into how it can be. Elaine Long wrote, I never thought I would get through a three-hour podcast, but the dialogue and debate here make for an incredibly compelling listen and a refreshing change. Thanks, Adam Boxer and Rethinking James. I also got my whole house clean in that time. And Ollie Lovell, a giant among edu podcasters and all-round good egg, wrote... I can't recommend this podcast discussion between Adam Boxer and Rethinking James highly enough. It also stimulated some fascinating debate on the Rethinking Education Mighty Network, the entirely life-affirming online community forum that has grown up around this podcast. If you would like to join us, you can do so by visiting rethinking-education.mn.co or by downloading the Mighty Networks app and searching for Rethinking Education. And so to today's guest. Ian Gilbert is a globally renowned educational thinker, innovator, entrepreneur, speaker and award-winning editor and writer who was listed by the IB magazine as one of their top 15 educational visionaries. Ian has authored many brilliant books, including The Little Book of Thunks, Independent Thinking, one of my favourite educational books of all time, and Why Do I Need a Teacher When I've Got Google, all three of which we discuss at some length in this conversation. Ian is also a highly skilled editor and has curated and edited many more excellent tomes, including notably The Working Class, Poverty, Education and Alternative Voices. This episode is almost like the opposite to the last one. Ian and I have many overlapping views, interests and experiences. For example, although Ian trained initially to be a French teacher, he found teaching a subject discipline didn't really suit him. He has described this part of his career as not wanting to teach French to people who didn't want to learn it. Instead, Ian was more interested in the kinds of things that I'm also more interested in, developing thinking, learning to learn, motivation, creativity, and self-actualization. This is a fascinating conversation in which we discuss thunks, Ian's brilliant invention for making children's brains hurt, neoliberalism, the ideology that underpins so many of our educational woes, and our shared love of philosophy for children, an approach that has been in the headlines this week for all the wrong reasons, to name just a few juicy morsels. I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. I look forward to hearing your thoughts. Ian Gilbert, welcome to the Rethinking Education podcast. It's good to be here. Thank you, Rex. Thank you for inviting me. 
Absolute pleasure. It's really nice to speak with you. I've been uh, very aware of and influenced by your work for many years now. And I think it was probably Thunks where I first came across you. That might be what you're best known for, possibly. Um, and just in case any listeners aren't aware what a thunk is, would you? I think it might be a good place to, to begin. What is a thunk and where did this idea come from? Um, yeah, thank you for that. It probably is what I'm best known for, I think, which is there, there are worse things to be notorious for. A thunk is a question that uh, doesn't have an answer, or the answer is either yes or no, or both yes and no, or neither yes nor no, or something else altogether. Um, so an example of a thunk, uh, when I've done an inset around the world, is um, you know, is a broken down car parked? Or uh, another one that seems to take off, and we were chatting about this recently, James. Um, if I go into a shop, into a newsagent, and read a newspaper without paying for it, walk out, is that stealing? And and th- th- um, is a what's the latest one I've been working uh, tried? Um, is a pregnant woman one person or two? Um, is it right to bully a bully? Does a dog mind what you stroke it with? Is there a safe way to die? They're all <laughs> they're all questions that get people. They're designed to get people thinking. They're not designed to get to to answers. An answer is a is a dead end, and an education that is in pursuit of dead ends means we're not actually focusing on the thinking. We're just focusing on getting to an answer and moving on. So 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 that's the thunk, and it's just, it's a, just a really simple simple little tool that seems to caught the imagination of teachers all over the world. And and we were talking about uh, yesterday, James, about how you were using it in your lessons. And, I've, and, and uh, teachers across, I know a guy who teaches maths is using it in maths, use it in English, use it all over the place. You can use it as a warm up. You can use thunks as a as a uh, in a PSHE. You can use them within a subject to start to really explore the subject. Um, and and what I've noticed, and I'll tell you where they came from, if I can, as much as I can remember. Yeah. Um, but what I've noticed with thunks, with working in this way, is that children will, and adults will say, my brain hurts. Well, my brain. And they're not really complaining, but there is that sense of, I thought I knew where I was going and now I'm not. And it's like, oh, it's doing my head. It's my brain hurts. And, and what I've noticed is I don't hear children, students, adults saying, my brain hurts when we're going through the the traditional teach them stuff, memorize it, learn it. And, and there's a place for all of that. I'm not dissing that, but it doesn't stretch their brain in a way, even if, even though it might be hard, the maths might be hard, but it doesn't seem to stretch their brains in a, my brain hurts sort of way <coughs> compared to, compared to the, the, the mental agility and black backflips and challenges needed in order to have a conversation about a question, which on the face of it seems as, as simple as our trees made of wood. Yeah, and I've, I've seen, seen you talking about this previously. You said that you you had a session with a student once, and he said that you, it's like you disbanded our brains, sir. Uh, that like it's like the, it, instead of expanding it, you disbanded it. As in, he said that I felt, feel like I know less on the way out than I knew on the way in. And you described that as as being like a form of anti teaching. And it, I, I often find myself in a similar position. I I often find myself saying conf- confusion is my speciality. And one of one of my favourite moments as a teacher was was in a in a philosophy for children session, and there was this boy who was quite talkative, um, and um, he'd been talking of quite a lot earlier on in the lesson, and then he sort of went quiet for a bit, and then he chipped back in later in the lesson and realised that he was contradicting what he'd said earlier, and he sort of paused in mid flow and went, "Hang on, I both agree and disagree with myself," and I just thought that's just such a that's wonderful great. thing. And that's something that I've I've noticed in your work as well. Maybe we'll come back to to thunks in a minute, but just while we're on this topic, that's something that I've noticed in your work. You've got another book, which is one of my favourite books about education, and it's not even necessarily strictly about education. Is um, the book that you have, Independent Thinking, which is a sort of compendium of observations and uh, and questions and bits of advice and short stories and. It's just a wonderful sort of life-affirming, uplifting read, um, and it includes thunks in it. Um, but one thing that sort of that strikes me in this is that you seem to be somebody who is quite comfortable with paradox. You know, quite a few of the things are where you, where, uh, quite a few of the examples in this book are where you're entertaining things that seem impossible. There's like cognitive dissonance, and for some people, would go, "Oh, that makes my brain hurt." But you seem to be quite comfortable in that space is that something that you've sort of thought about much before 
Is it was F. Scott Fitzgerald who said it resonates with the student you just mentioned that that, that you know intelligence is to have two conflicting <coughs> ideas in your head at the same time and still be able still to be able to 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 you know to to carry on if you like. So I don't have a problem. I hadn't thought about it in terms of paradox, although I like a good paradox. I like a good. Um, I'll tell you the par- remind me to tell you the paradox if it if it is such a thing of the fly stopping the train in a little while because this is one of the starting points for me coming up with my own sort of thinking puzzles for for, for children and right, we'll okay. come back to philosophy for children P for C as well at some point which you mentioned which is which was the where I started not only thunks but where I started in education P for C but it, it's it, it it's if it's all about knowing the facts a lot a lot of certainty. There's a lot of certainty being taught in schools because the answers are always there. The answers are in the teacher's head. The answers are in the back of the book. The answers are on the exam and you get them right. And then the world is ordered, organized and certain and we know the answers and we can move on. But the, the, the world beyond the world of education isn't certain. And as we've certainly spotted in the last 12 months, it's it's disorganized. It's chaotic. Um, as I said, with a thunk, the answer can be both yes and no. And that's OK. Um, so. So being comfortable with being uncomfortable, I think is the phrase that people use it, with regard to thinking about thinking and answers is, is a, a, a hugely important part of what we need to be teaching children. If we're teaching them certainty and predictability and security and that thoughts don't change and that thoughts are, are known and that knowledge is known and that's that, then we're doing a huge disservice in the name of education. And even when you you listen to the uh, you listen to you read the work of scientists talking about their specialization, or you read, which I recommend everybody does, the works of Richard P. Feynman around knowledge. And, and he's saying, you know, we, uh, scientists have a varying degrees of certainty between it might be this to we don't know. And, and that's that's what we've got. There isn't any certainty. And he says he'd, he'd much rather have. Uh, uh, answer, uh, not have answers than have idea have answers that are that are that are invalid or that are just palpably false. So the more we can teach complexity, and, and this is when we talk about you know science and research and education. If there's one area that we really need to highlight in education, I suggest um, it's it's the whole idea about complexity. It's about everything being interrelated to everything else. We can have a we we tend to be we tend to think in hierarchies. Uh, and you think about it in the environment and human beings, we tend to put humans at the top of the hierarchy with a with a with a planet's number one and everything else is sort of beneath us. And that has led to the situation we're in at the moment where we're in a lot of trouble in, in terms of the planet. Whereas if we put us in the middle of a web where everything is linked to everything else, an impact, something you'd read over, over here has an impact over there that we couldn't have foreseen. And if we start working with those sorts of mental models of the world, then I think young people going into the world as adults will have a far better chance of if not better understanding it at least being able to deal with the world that is unpredictable and complex and is what's called a complex adaptive system we're doing Mm. something over here changes something over there and then dealing with wicked problems and and a wicked problem you know the climate change is a wicked problem brexit has become a a a, a man-made well they're both man-made wicked problems Problems where there isn't going to be a resolution. Okay, that's the right thing to do. This is what we need to do. It's always going to be an, an element of it's the best we've got, so let's have a go with it. And who knows what's going to happen as a result of it? And that's and that's okay because that's how the world works. Yeah, absolutely. I love that phrase about being comfortable with being uncomfortable. Um, and it, like the opposite of that seems to be what Guy, Guy Claxton refers to as a certaholic, like somebody who's just sort of addicted to certainty and that they want everything to be to be sort of very straight down the line and that, you know, young children can get overloaded if we sort of if we give them too much uncertainty. And there's lots of, you know, talk around cognitive load theory as though we just need to sort of to to not overwhelm young people and to spoon feed them with just the right amount of information so that we can sort of build up their knowledge reserves and therefore they'll be you know be knowledgeable enough to be sort of creative or critical thinkers and so on and so just quickly before we go back to the start of where the thunk idea came from can i just like offer that that as an as an opposition because there there is a lot of the lot of momentum as you will have noticed around this idea of a knowledge-rich curriculum at the moment and a tradition like the nick gibb defense might be something like talking about thunks and whether glancing at a newspaper headline in a shop is stealing Sounds lovely, but it's not teaching knowledge, and we know that teaching knowledge is really important. So, what would be your your um, defence of thunks? What is it that thunks do um, that that makes them worth doing? 
Um, it develops thinking uh, at top level. It develops thinking. It's not there. It's like the, the, the student you mentioned who talked to, to me about uh, he knew less, knew less on the way out than when he came in. The anti-teaching idea. I'm not there to teach him stuff. There's a place for teaching the canon, the body, the knowledge, the, all that. I'm not, but I'm not there to do that. What I'm there to do is to get them practicing their thinking and dealing with, like as we said earlier, dealing with uncertainty and complexity and changing their mind. What's the phrase? Change your mind. Prove you've got one. Um, but underneath that, if you like, it develops thing. It, it, it has been shown, and certainly philosophy for children, the the, the 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 full thing, has been shown to develop oracy skills. And according to the Education Endowment Foundation work, that's especially relevant in children from poorer backgrounds. Yeah. The effect has been. Uh, so you've got like School Twenty One, and I know when School Twenty One started in London, which is a big focus around oracy. I know because there was a Guardian article about it a few years ago. They, they were using thunks as a as a way in. So you're developing speaking and listening skills and arguing and interrelationships and, and all of those sorts of things that we want human beings to have working together as a team, even if it's in this way, in, in a two-dimensional Zoom sort of way, but they still need that ability to express and listen and reflect and change their mind and argue. And all of those sorts of things are critically important, which you don't get by sitting passively, listening to teacher, getting and uh, taking the knowledge on board. Um, what I've noticed as well, working with the, with the thunks, is that it, it it hits the self-esteem button um uh, and the story i've told for several years now since it since since starting the thunks really is, is the school where the teacher head of year nine i think it was she said look we know what we're doing with our gifted and talented as, as they were then we know what we're doing with our troublesome oiks which they still are um what about the ones in the middle she called them the lost boys and girls the great children the quiet ones um that's interesting i saw a tweet today from a teacher saying on the on with online lessons her her quiet children are actually really active on the chat facility in Zoom because that's where they're doing all, the, all their thinking. So what what we I put to, we put together a program with this school of philosophy for children, which basically became the thunks stuff. Um, and what we noticed is it it really brought these young people out of themselves. So I could have gone in and done my motivational stuff, which is where I started this this job all those years ago. Um, but it, it and done my sort of rah rah tub thumping. You can do it and all that. But but what we did was just set things up in a safe, enjoyable circle, as it should be, the community of inquiry that allowed people to realise that my thoughts count, therefore I count. And you could see a real, just a real growth in terms of their their confidence in their self esteem. And what I've noticed. And, and the work that I've done around the world, specifically around thunks, whenever teachers have used it, they always feed back the same way. Are, so I'll be sitting in a, in a hall or a library or a classroom with 30 kids around me or whatever it is, with teachers observing from the edges. Uh, and, and there'll be that one child in the session who's just brilliant. They're, they're sort of logical and persuasive and eloquent and funny and sort of lead the group. And, and afterwards, the teachers will say, that child never normally speaks. That child has said more sitting in the library with you in the last half hour than they have all term. And then you start to think, well, why, why is that the case? And then you think, well, I wonder how many children don't join in for fear of getting it wrong, for example. But as soon as you take the right or wrong out of the equation, there are no rights or wrongs, then it, it's it, it entirely liberating. So it, it, you move that fear of failure away and it just becomes, they're just thoughts. And then if my thoughts count, then I count. And just one other example of that, James, is that I remember this girl once, we, you can do the thing, you play around with it, the, the format. So we're sitting in a circle, okay, if you think the answer is yes, go to this side of the circle, you think it's no, go to that side of the circle. And I had a class of about 25 of these, these, these lost boys and girls in this school. Um, and about 24 of them were on one side of the circle and one girl was standing there saying yes. And, and But you could see she was now vulnerable. She was exposed. She hadn't been in that position before. Um, but it's okay. It's safe. So, okay, tell me why you think yes and tell me why you think these people were saying no or wrong. And she started to speak and then people from the no camp were going, oh, yeah, and thought, and then beginning to move across to her side. And you could see her, again, sort of physically growing. Says, My words can change the world by me speaking there is a palpable change in the world around me. And, and I think that's incredibly powerful uh, um, benefit of working in this way that you don't get if your school curriculum is entirely filled with the passive sitting, waiting to be told from the expert at the front of the room, there's a place for that. Don't, don't write. I'm not dissing, I'm not dissing <laughs> that, but there's, there's, there's education. The, the phrase that came into my head was I walk in the dog last week. Education should be as broad as it is long. And, and, and my concern at the moment is that we're making it so narrow by focusing it purely on the knowledge 
that all these other things aren't that, that are so critically important, like being able to think, like being able to interact, like being able to like the self esteem. We're just missing. Uh, we're missing that opportunity. That. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're so so much on the same page with this. Um, I I got into P four C philosophy for children early on in my career as well, and uh, I think we'll come back to that in a moment. And I totally agree that the when when you see this in action, it took me quite a while to get the hang of it because it's not teaching. It's like facilitating a conversation is like it's not teaching, and like you say, you could def- define it even as anti teaching. It's sort of like helping them to unpick what they think they know. Um, and and it is like what you said about it, how how having no wrong answer. When there's no wrong answer, it's incredibly liberating because they're not. There's no judgment there. Then is there? They, like you can't be. You can't get it wrong if there's no wrong answer. And so the fear of failure. It's liberating, but for certain students, it's it's incredibly frustrating and scary. And it's the students who are the ones who, it, it, what I've noticed, are the ones who are most academically able, who are so used to getting the right answer quickly. They've got good memories, and there's a link between memory and IQ. There's a link between memory and and, and doing well at school. Clearly, so but but we tend to conflate intelligence and memory. And the example I give when I'm working with teachers is, you know, mastermind. It's really it's master memory. We we think they we, aren't they people clever, but maybe they are. But all we're seeing is them being able to remember stuff under <laughs> pressure. Same with universities. We're brain of Britain on the radio, been on the radio for years. It's memory of Britain, really. We don't really know how clever they are. I'm sure they are clever, but that's not what's being tested. It's the memory stuff. So I found the academically able students in the classrooms are the ones who are at the end of a session, a P4C or, or, or a thunk session, they'll say, well, what is, they'll be the ones standing behind, waiting behind saying, well, what is the answer, sir? What, what is it? And you say, what do you think? They're, they're incredibly frustrated by this world of uncertainty and good, because if they go into the world thinking it's certain and predictable and 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 everything is cause and effect and, and, and they know it and it's knowable entirely and everybody's got an answer somewhere, then we are doing them a huge disservice in a world of complete chaos. And and and, and for teachers who are listening to this, look at the students over the last year with the with the lockdowns and with COVID and everything. It, Who are the ones who have thrived? Who are the ones who have dealt with the challenge, even though it's been horrible? And who are the ones who have really suffered? I remember speaking, we did a whole series of webinars um, called What Now Week in um, May, June, I think it was. And I was speaking to one of the independent thinking associates, Jazz Amplifar, um, and her background was incredibly chaotic, terrible, awful. Her experience as a child was absolute, just, just a nightmare. And that's an understatement. And she talks about being a chaos navigator. And that's what she was. She was able, because the world was chaos and unpredictable and scary, and there was threat and physical abuse and sexual abuse at every turn, she learned to navigate the chaos in a way that the the nice children from the safe homes didn't have to. And we were talking about, you know, maybe it's the chaos navigators who are the ones who have coped better. And and I say this as adults as well, when you look at, we speak to teachers and look at what's going on on Twitter, it's the the ones who have, who, 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 are better with certainty who have, who have struggled most. So maybe navigation is a more important 21st century skill than knowledge. Or if we, there was a hierarchy, we put navigation above the knowledge. Not that knowledge isn't important, but maybe being able to deal with and find it and cope with it and all those other sorts of things, rather than just be handed it, is uh, is, a, is a greater skill. Yeah. Yeah. And I I, I mean, it's interesting, the, the, the people who argue for knowledge... I mean, I think that we we can accept that that they've made their point now. But the thing about knowledge is that it's necessary but not sufficient. And so, like, let's let's accept that knowledge is really important. But also, let's talk about like the not sufficient bit. Like, what do we need on top of that? And I totally agree that that like learning how to sit with uncertainty and what that means in terms of how you engage with the world, how you engage with a news source, for example how you engage with the information and the amount of disinformation, misinformation, just bad information that's on the internet and and uh, and in an era of deep fakes, you know, like we're entering into a crazy period of history where we are literally, you know, I could be I could be talking to a to a, a avatar right now and I wouldn't be able to tell the difference. And that's terrifying because like what is real in that world? And so helping kids to develop those skills and it's dispositional. This is where I think Guy Claxton has got such 
such a lot to offer. These these ideas of being a navigator, of being adaptive, of being comfortable with being uncomfortable, they're dispositions, they're sort of their habits that are sort of worn in over time. And those things are learnable just as much as knowledge and skills are learnable. Um, and I think that it's important that we get to that. Um, and, and especially, the, like you say, the, the, when you do this kind of work, the, the impact that it has on a child's sense of self, like they, they find out about themselves through, through sort of articulating these ideas. And I think that it goes even beyond self-esteem. There's something about like self-actualization here, like they are becoming more fully themselves. And you can almost see them growing an inch taller, you know, that, that moment in a P4C lesson when a kid sort of like tentatively sticks their thumb out for the first time uh, in a whole year to, to contribute and your heart leaps and you're like, oh my goodness. And you see them sort of overcome and you can tell maybe they've done it a few times before, but then they've pulled, their, they've withdrawn their hand, but then they actually go through with it and they contribute something and you can see that this changes them and especially when they're sort of addressing because they, when they speak in a circle they're addressing a whole class um, and then they start to change their perception of themselves and they think oh I could be a person who addresses people like this changes their perception of what they what their future might hold and this is not inconsequential stuff you know it's really important and this is what I sort of certainly sort of got into education for and I used to find that that being a science teacher, we spoke about this yesterday, was very restricting because there are there are some kids who I just could not reach in a conversation about you know plant and animal cells or electromagnets or whatever it might be, um, who I could reach. If you know, I remember this this pivotal moment where I was applying to be the head of PSHE and I hadn't actually taught much PSHE, so I didn't have a tutor group, and um, I had to teach a little bit of a lesson on bullying. And so I said to my year eight class, you know, if you get all your work done by whatever half past ten, can and we do this thing on bullying at the end of the lesson and they they did and we did it and um it, these kids who had previously not like you were like you were just saying who had previously not been able to get two words out of all year just sprang into life and they were able to look at this this sort of scenarios that that had come that I'd come up with from multiple perspectives and there was reasoning and critical thinking and they were evaluating evidence and they were doing all of these things that we that we want them to do in every domain but there are some things that are just like inherently interesting and and seen as valuable and relevant to them and therefore you there's there's no battle to sort of you know persuade them that it's really important to learn about electromagnets like you don't have to do that when you're talking about you know about is it is it stealing to 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 you know look at a newspaper in a shop because they go into shops and they do that and that's like they they already have everything that they need in order to have that conversation about whether this is right or wrong and especially when there's when it's about when it's about issues of justice, like kids seem to just have a, an inbuilt, very, very strong set of, of sort of principles and understandings and values around what is and is not ethical behaviour um, and where the sort of the grey... You can link that into the... Go on. You can link that into the into the subject area as well. So as a science teacher, I'm doing some work around people seeing science <coughs> and, and they were doing work work around um, the genome project and genetics and and it was okay well let's let's use it as a way into a topic I mean we talk about Rosenstein's principles of instruction which are all valid and good and make learning efficient but there's a there's a beginning which is about getting children enthused and motivated and interested and curious and all the things that we need before the instruction can can happen the most effectively so how do we sort of lead them in so I remember working with this school um, and it was like we were putting thumbs like if if your genetic profile showed you were going to die at the age of 25 would you want to know should you be told whether you want to know or not should you not be told whether you want to know or not should your parents employer insurance company be told whether you want them to or not and everybody can have these these thoughts and these and, and, and have a view and have a sense of moral rights and wrongs and ethics around that sort of topic which then leads us into the science so we can then just start discussing for you know do the do the knowledge if you like but we've brought them into it in a way that's relevant and real and combative which is what the things can be and and ethical and moral like you say children love talking about such things so so making it subject specific and i've used things in in Macbeth yeah, for, for at GCSE. I've used it in Romeo and Juliet at A level. I've used it as uh, for the P for C model as a way of um, revising for history uh, A level. So 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 while you can use it sort of just in an abstract way to get the thinking going, a bit like a you know you you warm up before a sport by doing something that isn't the sport. You can do that, and I'm okay with that. 
um, but you can also integrate it with a bit of creative thinking into so many different subject areas as well if you if that's something that you want to do yeah and there was something else we while you were speaking james this, this could go on a long time we both we both have got a lot to say on this topic i've got as long as you need <laughs> the question that came into my head a few years ago and, and it i've put it to a few teachers and, and you can really see it messes with their head and, and for me it's the most important question we can ask is what are they learning while you're teaching them what are they learning while you're teaching them and and if it's about sit down sit still know your place, be quiet, I've got the authority, I've got the knowledge, you don't have either, you will do well if you listen to what I say and do what I do and be like I am, then they're learning one thing. If it's if they're working in a more collaborative, creative way, um, it might be less efficient, and maybe we can come back to why efficiency is the enemy of education. It's not the enemy of schooling, but it's the enemy of education. Um, so it might be more efficient, but it might be inefficient working in a, using groups and, and get them to fail and uh, use some of the thunks and, and develop some of these other skills as well. But but they're learning about agency, taking responsibility, dealing with failure, making choices, working with others, working with others. They like working with others. They don't like all those others, making choices, all those sorts of things are being developed while you are teaching them. So, so for me, it's the, the, the most important question. An educator who believes in a broad education, not just the delivery of knowledge, has to ask that question. What are they learning while I'm, while I'm teaching them? Yeah. I keep wanting to get back to P4C and thunks, but you keep saying really interesting stuff that <laughs> make me want to ask further questions. Let, like, I can't let that hang. So, so you just said this idea that efficiency is the enemy of education. Uh, tell me more about that. The, the DfE have, have, or certainly had, um, an efficiency measure, which is your a school. They can work out how efficient a school is based on the inputs over the outputs. So the inputs is the money they give you. The outputs is the value added, divide one by the other, and that, that's how efficient a school is. And 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 I've seen the conversations on Twitter where people get people get angry, and the and the pedagogy police come in and attack you when you talk about inefficient learning. Um, and, and maybe there are times where you do want efficient learning, especially with exams coming up. You want to get as much in in their head because that's the game that we're all that we're all playing with regard to exams. But if it's a, but the efficiency means that we're missing out the opportunity to learn about ourselves, to grow, to fail, to to collaborate, to get things wrong, to fall out, to, or to do all those other sorts of things as well. Which for me, and I'm not alone, which for me is part of what we mean by. Uh, education educating the child to be a human being a contributing human being a happy human being all those sorts of things so if, if we're just focused on the efficiency which is why again with the, the rose and shine's principles of instruction they're okay and i like the phrase you use you know they're they're, they're, they're adequate but not sufficient or whatever the phrase is it's we'll, we'll do that but what else have you got what else are you going to do and then the what else have you got i mean that's for me if 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 and employers you sometimes hear employers complaining about the students that are coming out of the education system that they haven't got the skills they haven't got what's needed in order for they have to retrain them or train them to because they've, they've, they've got a lot of stuff but they haven't got what's needed and i think the the biggest question that any employer can put in an interview situation to the student who comes along with all their top grades is to say yeah that's great um i know lots of people like that what else have you got what else are you bringing to me other than these qualifications which are okay but they're adequate but not sufficient so all of this let's think bigger let's let's look at the what we which comes back to defining what we mean by an education and and based on dfe's latest guidance on uh, online learning which came out this week and which uh, caused a, a bit of a, a ripple through the twitter sphere um what they've said quite clearly is that education can be defined as uh, something like a rich curriculum that helps children know more and remember more yeah was that was that the dfe or was that ofsted i saw that quote during the rounds um, I believe it was a DfE. Okay, it, it might well be. I thought it was Ofsted because Ofsted did some guidance around. Anyway, whoever it was, it, they're, they're very much of the they're very much of the same mind on this, um, and so you know you could get a Rizzler paper between them. Um, yeah, I mean, I I think that you you're onto something with this, and and it's interesting because they are all the, the, these these ideas around sort of cognitive load and retrieval practice, and you know. Um, 
interleaving and spaced practice and they are all sort of methods of making teaching and learning more efficient within within quite a narrow confines uh, within me- measurable confines and that's that's the point isn't it that like what is measured gets done and if 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 a child wants to go off piece if they ask a really interesting question every every teacher's probably found themselves sometimes through gritted teeth saying that's not on the test and so, you know, we can't, we, we're we not going to talk about that because it's not on the test and the test is next week and we've just got to, you know, be efficient and use our time wisely and so on. Um, and so I can see how that efficiency agenda, um, you know, like you say, there's a place for it. You know, nobody wants that. Like, I'm always trying to make myself more productive and more efficient. And, you know, like you say, there's a place for efficiency, but there's also a place for... There's, there's, a, there's, a phrase, there's a phrase from Piaget, which is one of my favourite phrases, quotes from education, which is intelligence is what you use when you don't know what to do. And, and the efficient model of receive and repeat uh, is efficient for passing exams, but it doesn't really s- s- test that intelligence. Intelligence is what you use when you don't know what to do. Yeah, yeah. So having them confused and bewildered and... I don't know what's going on. It's it's great. Whenever I was I was a French teacher for a while, and 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 I was I would deliberately make my instructions both focused and vague at the same time. Focused as in okay, this is what I want you to do, but vague as in you might end up doing something else, and that might be okay. And and sometimes the the interpretation of the task that I set certain children, the way they interpret it was far better than anything that, that I'd set. And so rather than me saying, "Oh no, you didn't answer the question," I it, it, I embraced that. So that sort of vagueness, sorry, that's that 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 focus and vagueness at the same time, which is back maybe to the paradox that we talked about earlier, I felt was really important as a as a teacher in setting tasks. Mm, yes, yeah, I like it. Um, so let's let's go back to P4C because you said that. So which came first for you, thunks or P4C? Um, I when I was when I, I did a degree. At, Durham University, a French degree, and then uh, didn't really know what I wanted to do. And uh, but I was determined never to be a teacher. That was definitely not on the list. And then I remember about the first year after I graduated, I think I watched a television program on the BBC called The Transformers, um, which they focused on I think three significant educators from around the world. I think one was the is it called the Butterfly Institute in I don't know Bulgaria or the behind the Iron Curtain. Then I can't remember where it was. Um, there was another one. And then there was a story, a, a whole hour long documentary about the work of a guy called Professor Matthew Lippmann and a thing he called philosophy for children. And it focused on two schools in America. So one was sort of leafy New Hampshire, wealthy uh, uh, class um, in both senses of the word, uh, five year olds. It's called Teaching Philosophy to Five Year Olds. I think that was the name of that Transformers episode. Um, and, and you could just see this model of children sitting in a circle and having these discussions using the proper P for C model of giving them the stimulus and then get their questions and then go back and all of that. And it just, it, it was, it, the questions these children were coming up with was um, were amazing to me as a non-educator at the time, but also you could see were amazing to the teachers that they were working with. But then the other group that they were, gone. you want to say something? I was just going to say, just in case any listeners aren't familiar with what P4C is, like, would you mind just explaining a little bit about, you, you were talking about the stimulus and so on, what is it that Lippmann sort of came up with? So, so Matthew Lippmann was a professor of philosophy in the States in the sort of 70s, early 80s, and he realised that his undergraduates couldn't think for themselves. They could tell him what Descartes thought or Socrates thought, but weren't able to actually think in a philosophical way for themselves, and he felt we needed... He needed to change that. So he put together a programme, which he called P4C Philosophy for Children, with a series of stories, um, uh, just simple little stories, but embedded into it lots of opportunities for philosophical dialogue around ethics and morals and rights and wrongs. And and, it, and, and the series of stories starts with sort of four or five-year-olds that you can read with working way up to 18 and, and, and beyond. And the format that he identified that worked best to, to, to make this work, philosophy for children, was you're sitting in a circle, you called, called a community of inquiry. You give them the stimulus, uh, which might be one of his stories, but it could be a picture or a video or an a, a artefact or whatever, poem. Um, you read round the group. So everybody takes a sentence each. This is how he set it up. And if somebody wants to pass, then that's OK as well. And then you, after you've read that particular chapter or that part of a chapter, um, everybody then in silence has got a few minutes just to think of a question that comes into their head from the stimulus that they've read. The facilitator then, whether it's a teacher or with older children, it could be one of the teachers, will then 
take the questions and write the questions up on the board or on the flip chart with the name of the person who put that question up. So all you're doing at the moment is gathering the questions. The next stage is to decide as a community which, which question we will start with. And that's and that takes a while. It's quite a, it's quite a lengthy process, but you are developing issues around democracy, choosing, um, proportional representation. I remember doing this with the class ones. If there were 10 questions, and if, if four people wanted that one and two wanted that one and one wanted that, and, and, and people say, oh, you, you go with the one that had the most votes. But I'm saying, well, but there's 26 people didn't want that one. So which one do you go with? Oh, yeah, uh -huh. okay. So it, it, you, can, you can unpick it in all sorts of ways, but you, uh, eventually you'll get to the position where as a class you choose, and then you take that question, you bounce it back to the name, whoever posed that question, take us to this question, why did you, and, and sort of let the philosophy begin. You then go through the process of the discussion, going backwards and forwards across the circle, not led by the teacher going backwards and forwards. And then you always end with, and this is so powerful, and I use this in all sorts of ways. Okay, you've got a minute in silence. I want you to think of one sentence in you, that's in your head now as a result of with the session of that's lasted an hour or half an hour, whatever. And then you go around the group after they've thought, and they can say pass if they want to, or you can come back to them, and, and you get the sentence that's in their head, which is a really powerful way of getting closure. I use it a lot when I'm doing inset or conferences, not just around the P4C and the funk stuff, but it, as, a, as a presenter, as a speaker, it gives me a real insight into what's going on in their heads, and it gives them a real insight into what's going on in each other's heads as well. So that is, that's the traditional P4C model, and I recommend there, there's an organization in the UK called Sapere, which grew out of as a result of, of the experience I had as well, and others did of watching this thing called Transformers. And people were saying, Where can I find out more about this? So Sapere sort of grew out of that, and they do the uh, you know, level one, level two training. So, but the thunks for me are a way in to then go on to do it pro properly, if you like, if that's if that's what you choose to do. And I'll come back to uh, Transformers second class in a minute, but go on, James, you want to, do you want to add anything to that definition or that description of how P4C works? No, I don't have anything to add to what you've, I think that's a really, really good description of what you've done. I do, I was just reflecting on the, you know, that, that, that idea of, of summing up with a sentence at the end of, at the end of a session, I used to go around the class and do like, a, you know, like, has anybody got any final words to say, for example, but I think that asking them to formulate it as a sentence and giving them a few moments to reflect on that could really help them to sort of bring clarity to their thinking. Um, so I wish I'd done that, the little, like, if I could go back in time. Um, but like you, I, I sort of, I could immediately see, I was a gifted and talented coordinator for a while, for whatever that's worth. G&T was a whole bit of a crazy idea, wasn't it? But anyway, um, I was at a conference and somebody was talking about P4C. In fact, two people spoke about P4C that day. And I remember just scribbling it into my book and I like, wrote it in capital letters and underlined it. You have to get trained in this approach. And then, like every, always happens when you go to a conference, you go back to work the next day and completely forget everything. And about a year later, I came across this pad and I was like, oh, my God, there's a thing. I've remembered it finally. Um, and I arranged to get trained in it. And it was and, it, and I was doing a master's and I was I was teaching P, uh, PSHE by then. And um, I wanted to explore the use of P4C, of using this sort of circle time thinking skills approach to teaching uh, PSHE. And so that was the focus of my master's. As I taught six lessons and recorded them and sort of transcribed them and wrote it up. And sort of I wanted to see if I could detect any changes in, um, in the way that the children spoke or what they said over these six lessons. And actually... Um, it didn't work at all. <laughs> it was, it was, uh, I, I, I was essentially trying to run before I could walk where I, it wasn't my class. So I, I, I wasn't, I wasn't, um, that's right. I wasn't, I wasn't teaching PSHE myself at the time. So I had to take over somebody else's class for these six lessons in order to do my master's study. And so I didn't have very good relationships with that class and they were quite a lively class anyway. Um, and so I recorded all this, these lessons and typed them all up and it was time consuming stuff. I spent six months of my life writing about something that didn't work. And I, and I sort of got to the end of this process and it was just thought, oh man, that was brutal. Like it did not feel good. Um, but I found that when I went back to the classroom, after having spent the whole summer sort of, you know, curtains drawn, bashing away at a keyboard, um, I saw, I, I found that when I went back into the classroom, that process of having written 
about it and thought about it and read and reflected so deeply on like why what what a what what this practice is and why thinking and listening are so important to develop so thinking and uh, reasoning are so important to develop and the role of speaking and listening in in you know helping kids develop their thinking and reasoning skills I found that it had been totally transformative in terms of my own practice and things that I'd previously sort of had understood on an intellectual level about the importance of these things. I now sort of felt in my bones and it changed the way that I interacted. Like you say, with the things like giving vague instructions and just knowing when not to give, when not to give, you know, too much, too much steer, too much guidance. Um, and so it was transformative. And I went on to, to um, as you know, sort of get very immersed in the world of learning to learn. And P4C became the beating heart of, of our learning to learn curriculum. And we were using thunks, you know, and, and I would often find that thunks would, um, you know, it was the thunks that I sort of personally would be drawn to that I thought, oh, yeah, there's, there's one that's like, is there more future or more past? And that's right up my street, the sort of, the, you know, the metaphysical type stuff. Um, <clears throat> and but I would often find that it was those it was those sort of like moral moral philosophy type ones like. Is it stealing um, if you if you eat a, eat a loose grape in a supermarket, say? And I would think, oh, we'll, we'll try that one, but they're not going to, you know, it's a yes or no question, surely. And they would just talk about it for the whole hour with great animation and, and you know, fierce, you know, changing of minds going on halfway through. And, and so um, I'm an absolute advocate of thunks. And what I like about the thunk is that, you know, that, that process that you were talking about, the Sapere P4C process, is really valuable, but it can be quite, quite time consuming to get to the point where you can start the conversation because they have this stimulus, you generate questions around it, you look at the types of questions that like you say, you're voting on different questions. And that's really important work to do, you know, to, to formulate good questions and to understand about the principles of democracy, like you were saying, and voting, really useful. But you don't need to do that every time. And what I would find was that if you start with a thunk, it's just straight off the bat, you're into it, you know, and you can just go for a whole hour. So thank you for that. You gave me many hours and my students many hours of, of uh, really fascinating discussions. The, the thunk um, is the more future or past. I remember putting, I was involved in a television programme years ago where the, I can't remember what it was called now, but the students took over, the, the students became the teachers. So the students were the students and they were also the teachers. So it was a, teacher, a school takeover or something like that. And, and I was involved with that. And we had a conversation with this girl who was academically, you know, right gifted and talented and all of that and I put we put the question is there more future or past and she was saying well I don't know I said I, I know you don't know nobody knows but what do you think and it was like but I don't know I know I'm not asking you what you know I'm asking you what you think and it was she could not compute in that sort of way not that she was incapable of thought but it, it just the difference between knowing and thinking had not she hadn't worked on that yet and that's something that sort of stays in my head the fact and it was on you know caught on television as well this idea that that it's not about what you know it's what these questions aren't about what you know it's about what you think you can bring your knowledge to it um which is which is which is important so you can see um you know as children sort of start to battle with some of these the, these thunks they, they you know, i mean i use quite a lot of back to the science again um i like ones like you know if you uh if you uh, if, if you have a light bulb in a box uh, and then put it, and that's the only source of light. And then you put a mirror in the box. Is there now, and you switch the light on. Is there now twice as much light? Um, or, uh, or you know, if you turn the the torch upside down, does the light go upside down? Or which bit of the room gets dark first when you switch the single light bulb off? And so they're all they're all ways into physics. Um, but but it, 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 it the starting point is is just. I can't remember where I was going with that now, but it's it's it, it, what my what, why I thought about that. I remember having a conversation in a, with a group of children in um, it was a school in Australia. It was an independent school, and I only found out later these children were in like the, the nurture group because they weren't the academically high high flying as the rest of the school was. But they were brilliant, and we talked about um, you know which bit of the room gets dark first when the light bulb goes off. And this lad suddenly got he, he was about nine, eight or nine, I think got very animated talking about the speed of darkness. He said, because darkness travels faster than light. He said, I've seen it in a thing. And what he meant was we found out later, it was a YouTube video where some guy talks about the speed of light and how we can look at things in different ways. And he touches on agnotology, which is the, the, the not knowing that, and, uh, that it's okay not, not, not to know stuff. And, and you, again, you could see this child sort of being so animated and, and excited in the fact that I'd never thought about the speed of darkness before. Neither had the teachers or, or in the rest of the room. So it, it totally transformed us, him and us, 
and it's and the starting point again was that was the science and the thought experiments and and it's just it's, it's it's what you think it's what you think and it's also quite combative as well you know does a mirror stop working when you switch the lights off it it it, it gets some really angry <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely I've, I've, yeah i've seen that as well even like there was another favorite one was if you paint over a window is it still a window that led to some fierce fierce debates as i recall so there's there's the, yeah like i say there's if people haven't come across thunks you've got a, is it, is it, you've got a couple of books have you there's there's the little book of thunks that was the first one yeah. um which is probably the most popular one because it includes the sort of the instructions on what to do with it and then because i keep thinking of new ones we sort of keep adding it the, the most recent uh, iteration with new thunks as well as some of the, the best old ones is in a little tin i haven't got one with me a little tin of thunks that are cards so it just allows the teacher you can put cards on desks or you can you know pick a card or you can give a children a pile each and so you, you, it allows you to play to, to gamify it a whole lot more using this the, a tin of thunks it's called uh, each a thunk on each card right brilliant and th and these things are really good as well uh, outside of education like as parents they like, often go on, on holiday with another family and we often have like philosophical discussions and thunks are great for that so if you're stuck for something to do on a holiday and there's a website isn't there where you can i think there was a website at one point at least where you can just there find... has been yeah thunks.co.uk yeah but we i think we're sort of in the middle of updating that one but it just sort of sits there for the last how many years and there's thousands of people interacting with that the family one is interesting i do get feedback from families saying you know we're in the old days you know it's a holiday in the south of france in a tent and it was raining so we did dunks and or it helped with the car journey um one lady i met just before lockdown um her uh, uh the friends of hers her daughter uh, was autistic and just was struggling a little bit at school she was 10 or 11 i think and they gave uh, my the, the teacher who i was working with had given her a copy of the thunks to the girl and and she just immersed herself in it on these car journeys and what it did for her it she said i i realize now that there are other people who think like i think and I've come across that in other places as well with children with whatever special needs who are, it just gives them an insight into a world where they, where they were. <laughs> they they realise that they're not alone working in that sort of way. Another interesting use of the thunks in terms of its playfulness, I was approached by um, a, a Dutch guy who's at Exeter University who's doing a lot of work across universities globally around playfulness in learning. So he's got a sort of a, 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 um, a research group based out of Exeter University, but where they explore the idea of play and games and board games and all sorts of things as a way of making learning relevant and less stressful and more productive at a university setting. Um, uh, so we sent him a tin of thunks and he's been using it with that group. And I did a, a Zoom seminar a, few, a session a few months ago with people from around the world at that university setting, which seemed to go down really well. So that it's, it, it's, they're useful as a tool, they're useful everywhere, but the underlying principles around being no rights and wrongs, being fun, having a game, all those other things that we've talked about are, are relevant well beyond uh, a, a classroom. Yeah, absolutely. And so where did this idea come from? And and is this where the fly stopping the train thing comes in? Um, yeah, thank you for coming back to that. So um, let me take you back to the second class on the Transformers programme teaching philosophy to five-year-olds, which was, uh, I think it was um, Newark, New Jersey, it was uh, kids from the sort of, you know the wrong side of the tracks and, and 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 a lot of children who had to walk through crime and violence and poverty just even to get to get to school. Yeah. And and there was this young and, and they were predominantly kids of uh, uh, um, uh, the probably black kids, but the the teacher doing the P for C was a young white guy, so only white guy in the room, um, and you could see he was really struggling to connect. Maybe it's a bit like how you describe with with your class. It just there was no connection in order to try and make things work. So it was hard work for him. But there was one girl that they focused on in the documentary who, to begin with, wasn't interested. And then suddenly she went from, I have no hope. I, I live in a place where there's no possibility. There's, there's no optimism. There's nothing for me to, I'm going to be a lawyer. And it, and it was, based on the, what we saw in the documentary, it was this process of helping her develop her her confidence, her ability to think, the idea that there are possibilities, that there are options, that there are other ways of looking at the world and other ways that the world can be that came to her through the experience of doing P4C. And, and that was the most transformative element for me of seeing this, what education can do. And even at the time when I was determined not to be a teacher, I was working in industry, then I was working in advertising. But I remember thinking to myself then, if ever I 
if ever I was a teacher, which I don't want to be, but if ever I was a teacher, I would do P for C. And then I had a French degree, and so it was like, okay, I remember my mother-in-law at the time telling me, you know, you've, you've got a degree, but you're not a doctor, you're not a plumber, you're not anything useful. Um, so I trained as a French teacher, um, but that was, for me, that was a way in to do the P for C, but also I was into thinking skills and mind mapping and um, uh, help and learn to learn and motivational sort of stuff. So I, I, I even in my NQT year, I was doing, doing all these extracurricular work and we had a thing called the think tank that I set up where we did P for C at lunch times and sometimes after school. Um, so that was my, that was sort of my way into doing P for C. And I was at the very first SAPRE meetings when they started um, so I was sort of, yeah, I just that that was why, that that's what got me into education, not because I desperately wanted to be a French teacher. I wanted to be a French teacher as much as the kids in Northampton wanted to learn French, to be honest. Um, but it allowed me to work with them in such a way that, 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 that we could sort of, you know, make a difference. And Independent Thinking, the organisation that I set up 27 years ago now, grew out of that work because we did thinking skills holidays. Just sit all, I did assemblies around all of this. And um, there was a colleague in the staff room Sue Chamberlain, she was called, who her, uh, her husband, Paul, had sold his engineering business and they had some money to invest. And she said, I really like what you do. She really believed in all this sort of stuff. We'd like to lend you um, £20,000, it was at the time, 20 k to set up as, an, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a company in order to be a vehicle for you to do this sort of stuff. So that was, that's, that's a life-changing experience. Mm. We talk about life-changing moments. There was one prior to that, which maybe we'll come back to, but that was one where somebody says, you have the choice if you want to leave full-time education here's 20k to help set up a company uh um, paul chamberlain was able to sort of mentor me through the process i've never thought about being an entrepreneur before um not well i've done a diploma in entrepreneurial management which was the first um life-changing experience but the idea of setting to do this as a limited company was was different but that's that was the starting point and so and independent thinking has had various iterations over that. It's sort of grown organically to 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 what it is now, um, and we've been sort of centre stage to being flung out to the edges again. And I much prefer working in the edges. You get a lot more done in the edges. But that was the starting <laughs> point. So I would do these uh, P for C um, in these in, while I was teaching, and then the question of when does a, the paradox thing? And I hadn't thought of it as a paradox, and I, and I can't remember where it came from. Um, I think it's one of my ideas. I don't think I read it anywhere else, but you never know with these things. Um, it was like, if you've got a train traveling 70 miles now that direction, and then a fly traveling in that direction, the fly will hit the train windscreen and then change direction. So for the, for the fly to go in that direction and then in that direction, at some point, my understanding of it is that fly is going to be not moving. To go from that to that, that even if it's a tiny fraction of a second, it's going to be stationary. It's stationary at the same time that it's in contact with the train. So does the fly stop the train? Are they are, are, are neither stationary, in which case what's happening with the physics of that? Is there not a stationary bit between going to that and going to that? What what what's <laughs> what's what's going on there? And I and I would I don't know the answer to that, but it's those sorts of things. I think that sort of thinking, that paradoxical thinking that that I suppose, and I hadn't thought of it in that way, but I suppose led to the to the thunks, to the questions there, where the answer is both yes and no, and who knows, and something else altogether. And, and one of the first, when I set up independent thinking, one of the first contracts I got was to work across Northamptonshire on a, it was a learn to learn sort of program. This was, so this was, um, what we're talking about, early uh, 90s. So probably similar to when you were doing your stuff, James, but I, I was asked to go in and work uh, across schools across Northamptonshire for a project. Uh, and Guy Claxton had been involved in this as well. So some of those, and Jackie Beer was involved with this. She was a head teacher at the time, or well, she was a deputy, then then got a headship. So I got the opportunity to to do a lot of work around learning learning skills and and creativity in lessons, and and do like surgeries in schools, and go into classrooms with teachers and help them teach in in a variety of different creative ways, just to give them access to things around multiple intelligences, which which is something maybe we can come back to because. The, the, there seems to be this sense of we've got rid of learning styles, so we'll get rid of multiple intelligence. But the two were never the same thing anyway. So and multiple intelligence is so valid as far as I'm concerned. But we touched on those sorts of things. But also because of the P for C work, the philosophy for children work, a lot of schools were saying, well, can you sort of light the blue touch paper on, on helping us to do P for C? So I would then go into schools, primary schools, secondary schools, special schools, infant schools, every school in Corby um, in Northamptonshire and, and just model the P for C stuff for the teachers 
as a as a way in really just to show them what these kids were capable of when it came to thinking and and the funks grew out of that and i have no idea how or when or when the name when i started using that word i cannot remember but what i do know is that if you do p for c the way it should be done it's time consuming in terms of preparation you have to prepare you have to find a resource you have to photocopy it you have to get it all done yeah so you can do all of that sort of stuff or not uh, you can just, you know, not do that, have the evening to yourself. And then when you get to school on the way in, <laughs> think of a question that will get them thinking and throw that at them and see what happens. So so I much prefer that second option. So the thunks and the, the, the lazy teaching approach, really, it, it, it sort of grew out of this. Let's just just let's just get on with it. And especially where sometimes I'd, I'd, I'd only have 20 minutes or I'd only have half an hour and you can't go through all of that long winded P for C stuff. Um, so it was just like, okay, well, here's what you can do, teacher, when you've got a bit more time. But for me, I'm just going to go straight in and just, so here's a question. You know, if I get a bunch of flowers and stick it in the back of a computer, does the computer become a vase? Off you go. And that was that was the starting point. So that's where Thunks originated. Um, right. Yeah. And so I guess that you just sort of grew a collection of them and you thought, OK, or did you did you undergo a process? Because you've come up with so many. Like one of the things that I'm amazed by is that it's actually quite difficult to come up with really like the, the, these. Like if you stick flowers in the back of a computer and like, is it a vase? That's not a, that's not a thought that many people naturally have. Right. So I'm sort of curious as to find out, like, was there was there, I mean, was there somebody that you were bouncing ideas off at the time? Did you sort of sit down and go, I'm going to try and write a book of thunks or did it sort of happen organically? are you just like a natural thunker like what's the where did it sort of how did it accelerate to the extent that it did yeah i think i'm just a natural thunker which perhaps comes back to this the idea of dealing with paradox and, and just being and it's being curious as well um the, the word curiosity and curare curare and, and and to curate to look after they're all sort of linked so you just start to be curious and you start to ask questions about why is that like that and, and, and I think that that curious nature and that ability to interrogate the, the world around you, which includes the feelings and thoughts and beliefs and ethics and morals, just to sort of interrogate it and not just take it at face value. I think then if you have that or if you've developed that, and I don't think I had that at school, I think that came afterwards and, and inspired by the Transformers programme, I think, amongst other things. If you if if you have that, then then it becomes a little bit more natural to to question. And and I think young children will have that. They they are they have the question mainly, don't they? They will always say, "Why is that like that? And how is that like that?" And you know, well, is a is a is a bat more of a bird than a penguin is? You know, that you start to sort of see connections and 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 ask these sorts of stupid questions. No, a bat is a mammal because it does this 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 and this. And uh, and and it's there's it a childlike nature to it that that we need to i suppose encourage in uh, the, the children hang on to as they go through an education system that could maybe knock it out of them yeah but that we can we can we can um develop in our in our own selves as well as adults when we're dealing with certainty and day-to-day -day stuff and serious serious things we can just start to ask questions about about the world i suppose yeah, yeah, thank you. Well, it's, I mean, I love thunks, as you know, um, and th there's, there's a lot more to your work than this. Uh, you know, you've, you've written many books and edited many books, and I, I really um, I really enjoy your writing as well. You, you have a very sort of sparse... Um, sparse writing style that, and, and it's often sort of quite jarring like you just sort of you you write like unexpected sentences you're like oh okay and and again it, i mean it's like like i say that's why i sort of thought that maybe the, the paradox idea is bigger than the thunks thunks might be an example of that but uh, just as an aside there was a really interesting interview that i heard recently with brené brown who interviewed obama um, about his his new book, The Promised Land, the first part of his memoir about his presidency. And she, most of that conversation was about paradox. And she talks about how she thinks that, that a lot of a lot of the qualities, I don't know if you're familiar with Brene Brown's work, she's a brilliant person. Um, she works a lot in leadership. Um, and she says that she thinks that a quality that lots of that lots of very strong leaders possess is this ability to sit with tension, to sit with paradox and to to not be sort of to not just take one side in some partisan debate. But it's when you can sort of wrestle with that tension and you can see both sides of something and you try to somehow address both simultaneously that she thinks that that's what great leadership means. So I recommend that. I think that you'd be interested in it.
Okay, so we've heard um, a sort of a, a little bit about the middle bit of your life, if you like, in that in that uh, journey to to creating funks. Um, but as you know, in this podcast, I like to to find out about the guest quite thoroughly before we get into the rethinking education part, because I want to know, you know, why it is that you are the person that you are, you know, and and so far in the podcast I've been consistently sort of delighted that I've taken this route to ask people about their lives um because it's always um you know on earth really interesting stuff so I'd like to take you back to the beginning now if I may and to your childhood and your own experience of education um and and in particular as you mentioned then you know we talked about this yesterday this the idea of significant moments of learning that sort of go through your life um if there are any sort of moments of, of sort of real light bulb moments that you feel like have, have, have shaped your thinking to date, it would be great to sort of to hear about those as well. Yeah, thank you. I mean, it's a good question because it does make you think what, what are the moments that, that change things? So it, it, it's, it's a powerful question. I was, what was I born in 1965? So, so at school in the seventies, um, sort of, I don't know, sort of lower middle class, something like that. It was, you know, we we, we were okay. Everything was normal. Um, family were fine, good. Mum, dad, grandparents. It was, it was a perfectly normal, acceptable childhood. Going into going into university from that. So, so then you think, okay, well, what helped shape me? Um, the school I went to, the primary school we went. To was it, Leicestershire was quite progressive at the time I find out now and the school I went to was a brand new primary school around the corner from where I lived and it was open plan um which which I can there will be teachers now screaming saying no <laughs> um but I loved it and and uh, in terms of your question what what is one of the earliest things I can remember that uh, that helped shape me I remember writing a we'd, we'd done some work it might be about the Vikings or the Saxons or something and how they liked all- alliteration in poetry and I wrote this poem on the back of, remember, if you're at school in the 70s, rough paper was usually some old computer printout. Yeah. That had holes down the side, and there's like a pile of it, you took a bit off and wrote it. And I remember writing this, just off the back of my own, off my own back, to write this poem um, about a, a cat. There's lots of alliteration. And uh, I sort of handed it into my teacher. And, and when he handed it back, he said, oh, Mrs. Strong is laughing out loud in the staff room. He sort of read it out there. And 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 it was that sense of that I've written something that has had an impact on someone, right? Which, looking back, is actually actually that helped me think about myself as a writer. Which, despite all the other stuff that I do, is ultimately how I like to think of myself and how I, I you know, really like others to think of me. Is this idea that I'm a writer, and I think that was the first time that I wrote something that that had a life beyond the page in front of me. It went somewhere else and made somebody laugh. And I've still got that somewhere in a folder somewhere. I've still got that on that, on that green and white striped computer paper. <laughs> so, so, so that, that, that helped. And, and it was fine. I enjoyed primary school. I, we had a middle school in Leicestershire. They, they've got rid of the middle schools now, but it was a middle school, which uh, I didn't so much, I didn't like. It got me into French and French sort of marked my education if you like because I was good at French and I went on to do a, do a, to do a French degree so it introduced me to that but it, it introduced me to the, the, it, the it helped me understand that some of the most intelligent people I've ever met have been some of the worst teachers I've ever had uh, when there was all that push that goes, <laughs> you've got to have a two one you've got to have a first the brightest people are the best teachers is no they're not so my maths teachers were incredibly intelligent and their maths was absolutely amazing but they couldn't teach for toffee I, I came away that was my worst O level, uh, I, I scraped an O level. I did, I did a CSE as well because that was the class I ended up in. But I, I, I sort of said, "I'll oh, kind of do an O level as well." So I've actually got I, got, I got a C in a grade one. So I was, I was okay. But that was because of the teaching that I got subsequently in the, in the upper school. So um, yeah, middle school was a, a complete waste, really. And I also learned at middle school it was the first time I'd ever come across um, not bullies but bitchiness. I'd never come across just nastiness, bitchiness, and mm. and 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 that. That stayed with me, and I don't. I really, it really gets me when I see that just nasty bitchiness going on. Not just it's not just a female thing; males as well. And I think one of the things I've noticed on Twitter that I find most distasteful is it's not that people can disagree with each other or disagree with me or with independent thinking. It's that level of just nastiness, and then they get you know the pedagogy police get together, and yeah. it's just you don't need that. I just I, I I hate that. So that was that was transformative. Understanding that there are people who are just just nasty even though they claim to be your friend that, that, that bothered me yeah this, Second, this... At, at upper school come 
No, I was just going to say that there's something around that age that that is like the key stage three sort of age, that middle school age, where that really tends to happen. The shifting plates of friendships that that can suddenly turn to to extreme public humiliation and betrayal. This bullying so often happens. I've done a lot of work in bullying in my time. I noticed that it's almost always between people who used to be friends, because then that's when you can do the most damage. You know, you say something horrible to a stranger, and they're like, "Who are you? Just go away." But you say that to somebody who you used to hang out with at home or you know whatever it might be that really cuts to the bone and 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 there's something weird about about that sort of developmental stage where kids are sort of testing the boundaries and they are it's just a very commonplace thing especially among girls I've noticed but boys as well like you say um that that it's, it's really intense that period in terms of peer relations but it's been entirely surprising to me to observe what you what you went on to describe that that among the teaching profession on Twitter, you see <laughs> almost like, not quite the same behaviours, but like you say, very similar, really sort of spiteful, manipulative, unpleasant, goading sort of public in a public sphere behaviours. And you, like, I think that lots of people are quite are quite shocked by the extent to which that happens within the teaching profession. It's, it's just it's just awful. I, I it, it's I mean the, the progs and the trads and all of that sort of stuff. But it's like you say what you. Say what you think. I, we can disagree, but why do you have to be so nasty about it? Why is it always about I'm better than you? And the phrase I use is, you know, standing on the throats of giants. You know, they have to prove themselves by making others. You're bad. You're rubbish. This is rubbish. We can't do that. It's the 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 um the first proper book that I wrote, Essential Motivation in the Classroom, and that that picture behind me is the is the cover from it, Time Without Shadows. I'll talk about that if you like at some point. Um, but I think I started with a line that I borrowed from, a, I think it was a Stephen Pinker book, and he said something along the lines of everything that I say might be wrong, but at least it's a start. And I love that. And, and again, you look at science, you look at that, how it's, you, 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 it's an iteration. Everything is an iteration. We thought this, but now we realise we don't think that, but that's led us to this, which we now think, which might probably lead us to something else in the future. And that's how it works. But as opposed to you thought that, therefore you're stupid, therefore you're wrong, burn the witches who've done brain gym, let's move on. You, How dare you have been so stupid as to have considered it, that there was such a thing as whatever, I don't know, learning styles or something. And it's like, but it, it, it helped us think about, it helped us move us forward in, in one particular direction. Yeah. It's, and there's no silver bullets. And, and you know, okay, everything suddenly it's into um, growth mindset. And then somebody introduced some research that's, as, as they have done that said, actually, it, it doesn't work. And it's on to the next thing. But if it helps us think about the nature of learning and ourselves, and it's a bit like what you identified with your uh, with your masters. Now we know what doesn't work. Now why didn't it work? How did I? I used to say this to teachers when I was talking to them about giving them ideas. And they, oh well, that didn't work. Oh, okay, that's interesting. Because how did you get that not to work? And then you start looking at the research, and 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 it's <laughs> it's what what it's what work. It's not necessarily the what works agenda. It's the what worked. So much of it is the what exactly. worked agenda. Yes, yeah. That worked for me then at that point in time with those people. And, and as a teacher, you know that you know it, it worked on a Tuesday morning with 9C, but then I tried it again on Thursday afternoon and it didn't work. So so there's so many of these variables going on that we need to take into account. So the idea that you must do what the research tells you and teachers as researchers, I, I, there's a James Lovelock book, which is a brilliant book. All a bit where, where he sort of compiles various people talking about the challenges environmentally facing the world. And he, he talks about um, teachers as, uh, he used to think of himself as a, as a scientist, but he actually thinks of himself now as an inventor. And I love that idea, that change from it's about facts and science and doing it right to we, we'll try this. Let's iterate. Let's try this. If that works, if it doesn't, and so I, I remember writing a blog about this. That teachers are, you just consummate inventors. You will, if that doesn't work, you'll go on to something else. But if you've got mm. the script and the model that says this is how children learn, this is what you must do, and then that doesn't happen, then what happens is, well, I'm doing it right, so therefore you must be in the wrong. So therefore, we'll 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 we'll, we'll kick you out. But yes, yeah, yeah. so. Uh, yeah, bitchiness. Bitchiness is something that I discovered about the age of eleven, and I, and I hated it then, and I hate it now. Yes, yes. So, so you're in middle school. Yes, is where we got where we got to. And in set in upper school, when I, I again retrospectively looking back and thinking about it, one of the things because I my, my brain started to develop, if you like, I did well at school. I was academically okay. Um, so then it starts to sort of separate you a little bit from the from the friends. Or from the people who you thought were your friends, because I don't know, I don't know why. There's just people that suddenly you end up 
not speaking to and you don't know you think what have I done wrong but you haven't you just diverged if you like and and none of my family had been to university that and that wasn't a poverty thing it was just it hadn't hadn't sort of gone into their heads really to do that um and my French teacher Mr Archer when I was I don't know doing a GCSE O levels I think just sort of said well you you'll you know you'll, you'll you'll be going to university won't you and it's like well, I don't know I never thought about it I hadn't dismissed it I hadn't it just not entered my consciousness um and he had been at Durham University and, and he was very keen that the students he felt could could do could do Durham University would uh, would would go there so what that led to was me then doing A-levels and, and getting into Durham University which was uh, which was not as good as I thought it was going to be we'll perhaps come to that um um that was the first time I'd seen how divided we were class as a class uh, in in or our class the class divisions that we had as a country uh, when I went to Durham University as a as a middle class oik. Um, but there was in terms of the writing, there was one other a- element of you know, of uh, upper school is A levels, where I wrote an essay. But rather than writing it in the way that I felt an essay should be written, I wrote it in my style. And, I, and it came back with an A or an A plus or whatever she gave me. And, and it, it was just like, okay, if, I, if I'm if i me, if I write how I want to write in an essay and rather just sort of regurgitate and write in, a, in, in essay form, then actually that, that comes out better. So that, that was a real moment where I realized that I could, that, that life could grow for me through the written word. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so tell me about this thing with university and and class divisions. What happened there? <laughs> so Durham University, I expected to get to university. Bear in mind, I had no real knowledge of what university was, and it, and it would be just full of people who were just so we were all in it together, and we were keen to learn and grow, and inquire and be creative and and sit angst ridden in 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 bay windows staring to space writing poetry and. Um, it was full of a lot of upper class oiks who were just there to, um, they were going to be okay anyway. Uh, they got there not because they were particularly intelligent, but because they went to the right sorts of schools. And they were just about, you know, having fun amongst themselves, wrecking the place. But there was one lad just sort of wrecked his entire room and dad turns up in his Rolls Royce, writes a check, hands it to the bursar and, and, and on we go. And there was no, it was when I discovered that people can be, can, they don't look down on you, just invisible. So you end up being divided between the Ra's, as they would call them, the Hooray Henrys, the tights with their green um, barber jackets and their green wellies, and they're going off hunting at the weekend, and 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 then there's them in their own little world, and they don't need you, they don't notice you, they don't respect you. There's just nothing there. They just they're okay, and then there's other sort of just decent normal people who have been to decent normal schools trying to. Try, trying to get by and trying to make do. So I, I was quite sort of disillusioned with that. I'm glad I went. And, and I was at Hatfield College as well, which is, um, it was an all-male college at the time. People like uh, Will Carling, was, he was in the year below me. So you know what level of sport they were playing. Um, and maybe there were other colleges where I would have found more of a, more people like me, I suppose. So, But it, it was okay. I'm glad I went. And it, it does open doors. Durham University is a great university in terms of perception and tradition. But I noticed, interestingly, they were in the firing line a few months ago, I think, because of that sense of, the way that they treated at an institutional level, the way that they treated um, people who weren't from the upper classes. Um, but it, it's, yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I was sort of disillusioned by it. I did okay, got, got a 2-1 and, and, and sort of on we go. But it was what happened after Durham University. I did a business diploma in Durham University Business School dubs. Um, it, was an entrep- uh, it was a diploma in entrepreneurial management. So this was 88, 89. Um, and and Dubs or the, the area of the northeast realised that a lot of graduates went to Durham, Newcastle to a certain extent, but especially Durham, and then sort of went back to become accountants in in London. And they wanted to try and keep some of this graduate talent up in the northeast. So it was it was funded partly by the uh, European Union to um, get people to work in SMEs, small to medium sized enterprises, in the northeast and give them a mentor and, and work with them. And um, so that was I worked in Hartlepool for a while in a company that imported forest products paper and timber and it was it was okay um but we had a guy they, they used to be it used to include um uh weekend every few weeks there'd be a sort of a weekend session at the business school in durham and one day this guy liverpool guy called um dobbins i think came talking to us about what he called the psychology of success 
and and it was like well what's all this stuff about and but and I think it was just basically sort of recycling a load of I don't know Brian Tracy stuff it's sort of the Tony Robbins of of his time if you like mm. from from way back or Zig Ziglar those sorts of sort of 60s 70s um motivational speakers from America but it was incredibly powerful this was in terms of life changing he was saying you know if you if you want a 40 foot yacht is is your goal you can have a you know say it's your goal have a 40 foot yacht and just make work towards that and it was a sense of i hadn't realized how limited my expectations had been before it's not that i'd, I'd it's not like i'd seen the walls and thought i can't do that i just i'd i'd I love the sea. I spent a lot of time in Devon growing up. You see yachts, but I never thought, I wish I could have a yacht. Oh, I bet I could never do that. It just never entered my radar. And the way I described it at the time, it's like I was sort of, if you roll a ball bearing down a, you know, down a pipe, when it leaves the pipe, it carries on in the same direction. And that's what I was doing. I was just going in that same direction because I hadn't really thought about it. And what he did was like put a pin at the, at the, you know, about an inch away from the end of the pipe and then send a load of ball bearings down. And, and they start to go off in all sorts of directions. And that's what I started to do. I suddenly realized that what, what I thought was, why hadn't anybody told me this stuff when I was 16? Why hadn't anybody talked to me about goal setting and motivation? Yeah. And he was talking about multiple intelligence. He didn't call it that. He was talking about different sorts of genius. And why, why hadn't anybody told me this? And, and, and I had the idea then of going back into schools and working with young people and talking about these things. So that was the genesis of what independent thinking became, me talking to young people about the stuff that I wished I'd been told when I was 16, 18, as a success of the system. And, and, and I think two things that I then write about in my Google book, and also I talked about for over the years, is, is the, the, um, what I call the great educational lie, do well at school and you'll get a good job. And, and it's, we're not saying don't do well at school, but what we're saying is that it's not enough. You know, what else have you got, like we mentioned earlier on? So this, this the great educational lie that I was told that that was that we, st- we still perpetrate on children. And then the other one was, and I, will, and I will shut up, let you get a word in. So the great educational lie, and the other one was the secret of my success at school. And I realised retrospectively that the secret of my academic success in the school system was to sit there and wait to be told what to do and do it well. And not to think for myself, and no independent thinking, just be a good boy, do what you're told, sit there, work to the best of your ability, and you'll go far. And in the world of education, I did. But beyond the world of education, I realised as a strategy that that was going to get in the way of me achieving what I'm capable of achieving. Because while I'm sitting around waiting to be told what to do, other people are out there doing it, and a lot of them are a lot less qualified than I am. Yeah, thank you. This is really interesting. Um, absolutely, like the do well at school, mind your manners, and you'll you know you'll get a good job, and you'll be happy, and you'll earn lots of money, and you know you'll be satisfied. And the flip side of that is, therefore, if you're struggling here, and we know that you know the system requires that one third will fail, um, that therefore your life's going to be shit. And you know that's the that's the, the the sort of the hidden message there, and it ties into you know to to the the sort of the hidden curriculum, if you like, that you were talking about earlier that. Um, you know the messages that are often unspoken are things like um you know if you um if you have a question that's you know off that's off, that's not on the test it's not important like you're not important here what you what you want to know about is not what we're here to 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 find out about and you need to be compliant and docile and you know play the game and you will be rewarded handsomely and and that that seems to me that it does a disservice not only to those one third that fail but often also to the people who are apparently successful within that system and there's no shortage of people in public life my goodness who did very well at school thank you very much and went to the durhams and you know oxfords and cambridges of this world and who are there was a, there was a line that ian cunningham used in a previous interview who he was describing the bankers who caused the 2008 crash as being well schooled but poorly educated that that they are not we're not, we're not serving society well um even even you know by by handsomely sort of rewarding and celebrating success at the top end of this system so it seems like it's doing a disservice um throughout throughout you know it's this is not just a, this is not just about arguing for for you know like you know a better deal for for working class kids or for disadvantaged kids or whatever this is this is all of us are in this together so as as the phrase goes um you, you mentioned the the google book just now um that's a book we could remind me of its title so it's why do I need a teacher when I've got Google is the controversial title. 
yeah, why do I need a teacher when I've got Google? And this is this is an interesting point. And again, you know, some people might be, you know, gnashing their teeth, right? Because this is often it's been maybe become a bit of a canard that they they saw people people really rail against this idea that people people said something that was slightly different to that, which is like we don't need to teach knowledge when you when kids have got a powerful computer in their pockets. And and you know, there's a there's a point, there's a grain of truth in that. There's more than a grain of truth in that. You know, there's some there's uh, some very strong reasoning and evidence to believe that that knowledge is really important, and that if we want to, in order to in order to look something, E. D. Hirsch has talked about this, like that in order to look something up successfully, you sort of need to know a fair amount about that thing in order to know whether the thing that you've you've looked up is you know truthful or not you know or even and he even talks about you know um what's the phrase that he uses um polly put the kettle on we'll all have tea he's like even to understand what that sentence means you need to understand quite a bit about what that what you know what is a kettle what does it mean to put it on put it on what what is tea tea means different things to different people in different cultures and so on and so you know there's a there's a whole range of, of background knowledge that you need even to understand something simple um and and yet you know to argue that the advent of smartphones is somehow irrelevant here and the fact that kids have access to um to such a wealth of information um, at their fingertips to argue that this is somehow not a game-changing development seems to me that it's, it's to have your head in the sand somewhat um, but I haven't read your book um, the, the book about um, Google so would you mind just to articulate a little bit about what that book is about and what you're arguing? Well, let me just come back to the mobile phone bit first, because that will be a sort of a way in. I, I um, hosted uh, Professor Sugata Mitra in Hong Kong for a week, going into schools over there when I was living there. And um, one of the things he talked about was with the mobile phones, that we should see young people as a composite, his word, of them and the phone. That we should see them as the one thing, um, as opposed to their phone, and they can leave it there or put it in the box or keep it in their bags or not bring it to school in the first place. And and he he was using the phrase, um, uh, but we, we were in the international school, a uh, French international school. He was he was saying this. He said, "I don't know my way back to the airport. I and my phone know the way back to the airport." So if we start thinking about intelligence as this composite, and uh, uh, um, an example as well, I give uh, uh, as a French teacher, I now know that I can just go to Google Translate. And hold it, you know, if I see a sign that I don't know in a foreign language, I just sort of type it in the right language and then hold the video up and then augmented reality shows me in the same typeface, shows me it translated for me. Or I can do it, you know, via the phone. We can have this conversation. I could speak in French, you could speak in German. We could both understand each other because real-time translation is 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 a thing now. Yeah. So 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 the composite idea is and it also said the, you know, the only reason that we have exams in their current format is by in their form is by um, uh, denying the existence of the internet. So he, he's not saying knowledge isn't important. We're, nobody's nobody's saying knowledge isn't important. But we're saying if if we if if we measure uh, education just by written exams without the internet, then we're then we're limiting ourselves. And if we think that the that the knowledge has to be given to us by the knowledgeable person in the classroom, then we're limiting ourselves as well. Um, you know, the, the, the example I give with the teachers, you know, with the phone, I'm saying, look, it's, it's the sum total of all human knowledge updated on a daily basis. And that's that's the holy grail. That's the that's the philosopher's stone. We would have gone to war <laughs> for, for that. We, we the, Brit, the Brits went to war with the Dutch over nutmeg uh, over 100 years ago. We do it over a phone, but we, it's OK, put that away. We, we're not going to have it. And yes, there's all sorts of issues around using it well and using it badly. And, you know, in France, they banned it completely. And, and, but it's, it's let's, let's work out how to work with it as opposed to let's pretend it doesn't, it, it doesn't exist. So the Google book, just coming back to that, I, I'd read a book by a chap called Thomas Friedman called The World is Flat. And that was, a, that was another game changer in all sorts of ways. It was the first time... We were taught, he was talking about things like the BRICS economy, BRICS um, countries, Brazil economies, BRICS economies, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and, and everybody knows now China is you know, what it is. But but uh, however many years, 15, 20 years ago, China was still a little bit hidden, and and the idea that actually America owed China however many trillions of dollars um, was a bit of a surprise to people, and <laughs> let alone that perhaps Brazil, Russia, and India were sort of coming online as well. And 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 he was talking about the game changing things that were happening in order to allow this 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 level playing field in terms of e economics in the world. The world is flat, that was the premise there. And one of them was the technology. 
and how, uh, how instantly all the information is available to us. And I remember writing in the margins of that book, that phrase, why do I need a teacher when I've got Google? And so that was then. And then while I was living in Dubai, my wife had got a job uh, working in Abu Dhabi in the state system there. Um, uh, and I was working in Dubai. And I, I sort of put together as the follow-up, as a sequel to that book, uh, The Essential Motivation, one published by Routledge. They wanted another one from me. And I always believe two things with books. One is um, you only write the book, you write the book only you could have written. And the second thing is never write the same book twice. Um, so it's okay, let's come at something totally different then. So I started just putting together a series of things that I felt teachers in the 21st century should be thinking about and reflecting on and understanding um, when it came to teaching and learning. And, and, and the title sort of just seemed to be appropriate for that. So it's not, the whole book isn't about that, but that's just part of it. Why do I need to teach you when I've got Google? And the answer to that question is if you're good, I need you now more than ever. So it's not an anti-teaching book at all, if you read it. it it's, it, uh, I, we need great teachers. We need to define what we mean by great teacher. We'll come back to that. But what it does mean, if you're crap, I don't need you. And, and, and after that, um, because I can, I can, anything, if you're crap, anything you're giving me, I can get from someone else or something else. So don't waste my time. Mm. Um, and, and so I wrote that in Dubai. Uh, the year after that, we found ourselves living in Chile. My wife's originally from Chile. We'd gone back there. Um, I had two teenage girls at the time, they're grown up now, but they were in school there. And it was international school, supposedly. And it was like one of the top schools in Santiago based on the exam results, which is all, all we had to go on. And their delivery model was exactly that, just delivery. It was a teacher at the front, blah, blah, blah. Children copy, copy, copy. And then you get a grade. You, you'd, you'd have a test, you have a quiz, uh, get a grade with the mark and then sort of move on and that was the only model that they that, that they had and whenever I would say to the teacher look my girls aren't learning anything and they go well we're teaching them so it's not my fault uh, get a tutor here's a card she's my daughter she's very good um tutoring we can touch on that if you like and and, and how the whole PISA thing is 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 we're not comparing like we're like but put that to one side for now um so my girls were getting so frustrated and miserable going to this awful delivery model school and learning nothing. Um, I just thought, I can't do that to them anymore. And after about, it's about four months, I think, of battling with this school, trying to say, it's not your job to teach, it's your job that they learn and it's different. <laughs> um, that they, I just rang them up one lunchtime. I said, just forget it, just come home. So my girls left school, came home, and they learned more that afternoon sitting around the dining room table with their laptops on Khan Academy and Bite Size and YouTube than they had for the whole of the four or five months of being at that awful school. Yeah. Um, and, and, and the so I was sort of li suddenly I was living the dream of why I wanted to teach you when I got my my middle child, my eldest daughter, uh, sort of battles with this. She doesn't battle with dyslexia. Schools battle with helping her learn because she's dyslexic. There's a different sort of angle there. Um, but her learning went from sort of you know nothing to brilliant that lunchtime over lunch, if you like. How? because I suddenly prevented her from being taught badly. So why do I need to teach when I've got Google? If you're crap, I'll stay home. I'll, I'll get it somewhere else. If you're good, then, then fantastic, bring it on. So what do we mean by good? And now we start to realize that the good teacher may well have subject knowledge, but has got a whole lot more than that in terms of all the other things, in terms of the broader education that we can develop in terms of relationships and humor and getting them to think and getting them to build their, their confidence and their self-esteem and dealing with, and all the other things that, we, that we've already touched on. So if the teacher's bringing that to the lesson, then, then I need that. And it, just another example of that, I remember speaking to a group of heads from sort of edge, edge of London borough, white working class, male underachievement sort of area. And one of the heads was saying about a lad who had got into university, which is which was great. There are increasing numbers of working class children going to university, but they don't stay. Increasing number dropping out. Um, but and even if they do stay, they still end up in lower paid jobs than people who weren't working class going through, which stays with them throughout their working life. We'll perhaps touch on that later as well. But what what he, he, he so he got this lad into university. This lad got into university and he's very happy, working class boy, white boy. And he saw him in town after a few months at first term and he asked him how things were going yeah it was great and he said how are you how are your lectures thinking that's the normal sort of question you ask somebody at university and the lad said oh I, I don't go so the head teacher started to sort of panic thinking oh is he going to drop out what's going on so well, why don't you go he said well the lad said well I'll just find out what the lecture is going to be on and then I find online the best person in the world who's delivered a lecture on that and I watched that why, why would I get out of bed 
and travel across town to something substandard when I can watch the best <laughs> in the world from from home. So that was, and because the lecture is just it's just it may as well be two dimensional. There's no interaction. There's just you sitting. I mean, he would go for the seminars and the workshops and then one to one stuff. That's fine. But if it's just delivery of stuff in a lecture hall, go to Harvard online because yeah. it's all free, or Oxford online, or Stanford online because it's all free. It's all there, and, and, and do it that way. And, and I say that to teachers, and you see them go, "Oh yeah, good on him." And I think, well, so okay, so primary teachers, what would you do? What's your answer when the child comes up to you and says, "Miss, I've got maths, next, I've got numeracy next, but the teacher's not very good, and I'm part way through like doing mechanic at it, and I'm doing really well. So can I not go to the lesson? Can I just go to the library and sit there with my with my with my phone or my laptop or whatever, and just get on, or do I have to go to the lesson and not learn? What shall I do, miss? Mm. And what is our answer? How? What, no, no, you have to go, otherwise the system collapses. Or, yeah, that's okay. Yeah, this is the thing. Like the the problem that we it seems to me that we have is that it's just not flexible enough. The system to to take account of the diversity of human needs and human experiences and desires that exist within that system. And so, so often there are kids who are really good at loads of things, but for some reason it's just not working for them. And they end up getting into loads of trouble and getting detentions and exclusions and all kinds of things. And it becomes this sort of pitched battle just because, you know, if, they, if for example, they were allowed, there, there, was a, there was a girl who I worked with a while ago who um, had, had been excluded from a school because she was... Um, she was just doodling all the time. She was doodling, and she she left. I, I spoke about this again. She was a student at at, the, at um, SMLC, the Self Managed Learning College, where I worked, and she had a graphic novel that was just trying to get its way out of her head. And it took her about two years, from years eight to ten. She didn't do any English, math, science, none of that. She just wrote this graphic novel, which she later published. And I, I bought a copy for my son. It's quite an amazing piece of work. Um, and then she was like, oh, OK, like now what? And then she then she under her own steam, she went off and did about six or eight, you know, GCSEs, did really well, got into college. She's a brilliant, brilliantly creative um, and sort of well-rounded person. But that, that just wasn't working for her at the time. And she was getting into loads of trouble. And we happen to have, you know, we live in Brighton and we happen to have this incredible, very small scale alternative for kids like her who, for some reason, you know, it isn't working because the school, the, the school system is so inflexible um so i i agree that that we should that we should embrace more flexibility and i'm sure that that would you know um that, that i can predict what nick gibbs answer to that question would be um and so we need to think about you know how can we how can we change things so that it doesn't so that it's not up to nick gibb <laughs> you know and, and just just quickly on on the on the google book idea you know <clears throat> there's, there's something that i've been thinking about a lot recently which is that there's loads of kids, like, in the, I'm not sure what the exact figure is, but it's like in the tens of millions, I think it might be like 60 or 70 million or something, of kids worldwide who are outside of education completely, like not even in primary education. And so, you know, we talk a lot about disadvantage and closing gaps and stuff. Like if you're really animated about disadvantage and you want to do something, like that's the place to start. And so another really good question is, what does like what should you do, or what does good education look like when you have no teacher but you do have Google? And I know I saw a talk a while ago from by Jimmy Wales who was saying that they were looking at getting very very cheap smartphones that have got lots of lots of content from Wikipedia translated into lots of different languages already preloaded onto the phone, so it's not even like they need a four G connection. And they were distributing those throughout in, in developing countries, but there's still that Ed Hirsch problem, right? There's still that like you need to know a certain amount of stuff in order to be able to to figure out whether what you're looking at is, is good quality or not. Um, the, uh, I mentioned Sagata Mitra. I mean, his the hole in the wall experiment, that was sort of the starting point. What he now talks about self, um, uh, sort of self-managed learning environments. That is that sort of idea of children being able to, with the right resources, being able to learn for themselves in terms of another bit of research he did in, in, centri- in, in the sort of the countryside, in the rural parts of India there was an issue where if the teacher was any good, they would go to the city because that's where they could earn more money, which meant the children who stayed in the countryside weren't getting weren't getting quality teachers or weren't having any teachers. But he was able to, by, by giving them the technology, access to the technology, um, self-organized learning environment, soul, that's that's the phrase that he's using. They were able to 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 learn for themselves even without the input of the teacher because the teacher the teachers weren't there. And, and it's he gets into trouble 
cigar to Mitra from the people because they, they, they and the unions, you know, they, they had real trouble when he spoke a few years ago in the UK. And they walked out at some point um, because because he's arguing. Uh, he's not even arguing. He uses the word maybe a lot. Some of the most intelligent people I've ever met use the word maybe a lot or I don't know or what do you think? Try and see what happens. Um, um, but yeah, maybe is, is, is when he talked about maybe we should be thinking about the three C's rather than three R's, you know, communication, computation and comprehension, given how we can be a composite with our phones is, is more useful than teaching the, the three R's. But then the idea of, of that the children will learn better without the teacher in the room is, is we need to embrace it and challenge it and think about it. And I, when I heard him speaking in Hong Kong, you know, teachers were challenging him. They said, well, just try it. Just, it was a science teacher who said, my children will learn best because I'm, I, know, I know physics. And he said, well, don't take my word for it. Just take, take your class, divide them into two. You teach one half, the group work in, in, in the way that I've described, and then test them after, after you finish that module or whatever, and then just see who fares better in the test. He said, my research would indicate that the group who've taught themselves will do better, but just try. He said, and then test them again in, in four weeks' time. My research and my experience indicates that those who have learned my way will actually have recalled it better in four weeks' time as well. But don't tell my word for it. Just, <coughs> just, just try it. Just, just see what you think. So it's that openness to, to work in your ways and not be so precious about it. And then it, and you start looking at robots in the classroom. And so a lot of the work and a lot of the writing about that is it's not stop, let's stop trying to compete with the robots. It's not an either or. Let's embrace the robots. And the robot, when we're the starting point now, is things like Siri in the classroom or Alexa or whatever, but there are robots already in, you know, in classrooms. Let's, let's stop trying to pretend we're gonna outdo them. Let's use the robots for the things that the robots can do better. And let's use the humans for the things that the humans can do better. And let's work in a collaborative sort of way. And that's, that is where education is gonna go, whether, whether the teachers like it or not. My concern with the robots in the classroom is if it's about the delivery, and the fact that I, I was trying not to mention the N word, but you've had uh, the NG word, who we call it, uh, Nick Gibb, but, but I know he's a fan of apparently of scripts and textbooks and things. It's, it's, if it's you're teaching from a script, you're one step, step away from being an avatar teaching from a script or being a robot teaching from, from a script. And uh, then I think we are into, into well, okay, let's get, the, let's get the robot teaching from a script, teaching the stuff, and let's get the human doing all the stuff that the humans can't do. There's a great book on, robots and technology and education, which is a line, I think, from the Matrix, which is don't send a human to do a machine's job, or it might be the other way around, don't send a machine to do a human's job, but it, ultimately, ultimately, that's the sort of thing we're looking at. What, what, what do the machines do well? What do the humans do well? Now let's work together. Interesting on the robots in the classroom, and there's, there's a lot of research about how powerful that is. There was one trial in America where they stopped it. It was a robot working with primary age children. And they, they had to stop it on ethical grounds because the children were saying things to the robot of concern that they hadn't told the adults. So now we're into thunks and ethics again. You know, if, mm. if, 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 can you, if you tell a robot, a, a, if you tell a robot a secret, should the robot tell the humans? Is that a disclosure? Yeah. 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 AI, AI ethics. I've got, uh, there's a, a future guest who's coming on is a guy called Donald Clark, who's, um, who's written a book on AI and learning, um, which, um, I'd be interested to talk to him about. Um, and he actually, to come back to, to come back to this, to Mitra thing, I've not personally looked into Mitra's work in that, in that much detail, but I, I am at least dimly aware that there's been some criticism of the hole in the wall experiments. And Donald Clark uh, wrote a piece, one of the pieces that I read was by him, uh, suggesting that, that, that those experiments were not all that they were cracked up to be. And I, and I don't know enough about it, but I know that there is at least sort of some controversy around that. Um, but I, I like this idea that, that Mitra is um, a maybe merchant. And I, I agree that often they like, said to say, I don't know is the smartest thing that you can possibly say. Um, but you know, that, you know, the certaholic uh, mentality, you know, we don't often see people in public life. It's not, it's not celebrated, is it? It's not sort of recognized for somebody to, for, for a politician to say, do you know what? Can I get back to you on that? I'd actually haven't got an answer for you right now. That would be considered to be career suicide, but actually <laughs> that's exactly what we need. We need people who have some intellectual humility rather than just sort of bluff and bombast and you know goodness knows we know where that gets us and we're not in a good place right now so this this you know this is this is big stuff you know they, like this is all connect this is not just some sort of micro 
conversation about about efficiency and what makes for the most efficient or the most ethical even you know sort of education there are the, these ideas are connected to the to the wider world and i think that neoliberalism is an idea that connects all of this quite quite in, powerfully and you mentioned that you were in Chile um you've, you've moved around the world quite a lot haven't you you were in Dubai and then Chile I think you were in were you in Hong Kong for a while yeah and now um you got one foot in the Netherlands is that right and one foot in, in the UK um so let's talk about Chile and and what you saw there with regard to neoliberalism as it plays out as an economic idea and then neoliberalism as it plays out as an educational idea it- I, I hadn't. I'd always thought independent thinking was was a non political small p organisation that politics and education just keep the two separate, and and that that would be okay. Um, and then I found myself uh, um, w- w- when I when I remarried after I lost my first wife. When I remarried, and we can touch on loss and other things as well if you like at some point, and what we've written about that with my children. But in my that was a million years ago. In my second life. Um, so Monica, my wife, who's a school principal in Rotterdam, so that's why we sort of moved around. She was a vice principal in Hong Kong. She was, she was originally from Chile. She grew up the, on the receiving end, and not in a good way, of the Pinochet dictatorship. Um, she, she does, like a lot of people who were at the poor end of town um, and, and were on the receiving end of Pinochet and American politics, shall we say, across their backyard, as they called um, South America, Latin America, um, there is a sense of, there's a smile comes across um, their faces when they look at what's going on in America currently and think, well, you've foisted petty dictators on us who, who work in this way for years, so you've got a taste of your own medicine now. Um, but there's, there is an irony to them, which which, um, which is interesting. I think better, I tweeted... Yeah, uh, I think I tweeted after the the, the, the assault on the Capitol um, uh, that, that Trump instigated, um, and, and you know it's an attack on American values and democracy. And I just tweeted the, the famous picture of the the Moneda Palace in um, Santiago getting bombed by um, British-made uh, hawker harriers um, by the Chilean RAF, but in a coup sponsored by the CIA, uh, where the democratically elected president was uh, ousted, killed himself. Um, or was it, or, or was he killed? I think the suggestion was he killed himself. But that that this idea about yeah democracy and American values there's there's, there's a lot more to it than all of that. And and what why that happened in Chile <clears throat> was that you had a, a, a Marxist leaning democratically elected president that the Americans just couldn't uh, couldn't contend with not on their doorstep. So uh, and the Brits were involved in it as well. The British the the MI5 I think it was had a base over there as well and in other parts of of South America where they're worried about the influx of communism. Um, so, so Pinochet was put in as the dictator and uh, uh, only 3,000 people were killed and like other parts of that of the world where the, the numbers were higher, but that is quite often how it's seen, only 3,000 people mm. were killed, including um, you know, one of that number being my wife's uncle, her favorite uncle who was uh, uh, mugged as a taxi driver. Um, uh, but but what happened after that was that uh, a load of the sort of the wealthy young stu- male students went off to study in Chicago. They're called the Chicago Boys, and they studied under Milton Friedman, yeah. who is the free market, what's called neo neoliberalism sort of guru at the time. Uh, that it's all about the free market. It's all about minimizing uh, central government. It's all about free the, the free market and free enterprise, and that's how you will uh, everybody benefits working in that sort of way. So they studied under him, and then came back and introduced this free market economics across. So it became the sort of the melting, not the, the sort of experiment really. Let's let's um, privatize the water. I think it's the only country in the world that doesn't own its own water and still doesn't. Let's privatise the forests. Let's privatise health. Let's privatise insurance. Let's privatise um, schooling. Let's let's put it all into private hands because that's the model that will everything will work out better in in that model. So that that was the real sort of test case for for neoliberalism, uh, and and then people look at Chile and go, look, it's great. It's one of the most stable. It's one of the it's it's one of the wealthiest. It's it's one of the it's one of the best examples of this in 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 that part of the world and. If you look in certain places, it sort of is, but then if you look in other places, it definitely it definitely isn't. So you look at things like the Gini coefficient, which is the gap between the rich and the poor, and it's it's Chile's got one of the most unequal societies in the world, and and still has. And you look at 
then the systems that prop that up and in, including education and yeah if you're wealthy you go to the international schools or the independent schools at that end of town and if you're not wealthy you go to the poor state schools at that end of town and if you're aspirational but poor you 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 pay money to go to a subvention school in the middle which they've just they're finally getting rid of these subventions which is basically private schools run with public money for a profit so that 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 model just you've got a society that is split and then you've got an education system that may that that replicates and maintains that societal split so that's what i saw i'd never thought about this sort of stuff i'm just a boy from a lower middle class middle england school doing stuff getting on with stuff and and then suddenly my eyes were open to this other world where where the americans can impose dictatorships and economic systems can split families and can split societies and you can go from one side of town to the other and go from complete poverty to extreme wealth some of the wealthiest people in the world are, mm. are, are, are Chileans who have benefited nicely from um, Pinochet's largesse and still do, and still do. Um, so, and you realise then that you, I think one of the lines in the in the independent thinking book, which which was written over there, when you look at things like the state, you have to work incredibly hard to make sure the status quo doesn't change. You have to introduce all sorts of changes to maintain the status quo. And other things yeah. that I, le- I learned there is that, you know, the best way to foil a revolution is to smile, say yes, and do nothing. So many people, oh, yes, yes, we must do that. We must do that. Yes, okay, right. And then nothing. So so, it, so much effort was put into, into making sure nothing ever changed. And as one of my wife's family was saying, you know, it was at the time where um, I, um, Bachelet was leaving and Pinoch- uh, um, Pinera was coming in, so moving from left to right. But it was like... Phew, Nothing changes anyway, whether we've got left-wing government or right-wing government, nothing changes. They have just voted for a change in the constitution there, which came as a result of, they put the prices up on the metro, um, not by much, but if you only earn a pittance, not by much is a lot of your, a, lot, a, a large proportion of your salary. And, and students were the ones who kicked off and the students started jumping in the barricades, which then led to protest, which then led to massive protests across the whole of Chile. Uh, again, students leading the protests again, which has finally led to there being a referendum not not that long ago about shall we have a new constitution? And the answer was resounding a resounding yes. So that's the process that they're going through at the moment. So what I it, it opened me up to this idea that you can't separate education from politics. Edu- if we're saying education, the broader aspect of it is about citizenship and agency and doing something about something you feel is ultimately very, very wrong in the system. And if it's about making choices, if it's about collaboration, if if education is about all of those sorts of things, then it's about politics. And if we take politics out of education, we are are dumbing down, we are are castrating a whole generation by making it seem like they, 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 they don't really have a part to play in these bigger decisions that are being taken on their behalf. And that's so so wrong and it's interesting that citizenship is one of the things that Gove I believe got rid of critical thinking is one of the things that disappeared under his early regime um uh, climate change in the environment was one of the things that disappeared under his early regime all these things are the the most critical the most important things that we can discuss uh got got taken away from the world of education to be replaced by you know the the focus on the kings and the queens and the we must learn the the history of what made britain great and things like i don't know yeah we we britain if it wasn't for britain you know britain got rid of the the um the slave trade it sort of helped get rid of it but then changed it and benefited from it in another way and actually uh, one of our associates um mikey markham is sister is a, a human rights lawyer in london and she says the slave trade is alive and well in this country mm. and work she has to do linked to that but again we have this narrow view oh isn't britain great look at what we did we got rid of the slave trade well how much we benefited from it and then what we what we used to do was other slaving nations who hadn't got rid of it we would go and nick their boats nick their ships and, and requisition them and benefit from that with us so it's just yes yeah have you have you read akala's book natives Oh, oh, I've got it, but it's not. It hasn't risen to the surface to be read yet. But I've, I keep having it recommended to me as a as a good book on this topic. Yeah, it's absolutely brilliant, and it's a, like there's a there's a chapter in there about how as a kid he was told by his teacher William Wilberforce saved the, the slaves, and he was like, "Really, miss? Like what? By himself? Are you sure? Like?" And the, he was sort of you know like. Um, 
caught ho- hoiked out and was like, you know, this is this is this is supposed to be stuff that you're into. But he was like, you're talking shit, this. And then and he would, um, and he just went in, and he just went into the history of it. And my goodness, I learned so much from that book. Um, it's absolutely phenomenal. So, so, so my understanding. I mean, people often people often talk about neoliberalism. And then people often sort of rail against that as like, oh, it's just like a, a, the latest lefty trope that like, oh, you just sort of say, oh, neoliberalism is to blame, right? And and so it's essentially my understanding of it is quite basic, which is that it's this, it's like the, it's that like you were talking about it in terms of economics, it's about like sort of free markets and like deregulated economies, um, and small state and just let the market and the invisible hand will, you know, Adam Smith's invisible hand will sort of make everything okay, and that people will act in self interest and by acting in a self interested way, for example, by you know, wanting to make money. So I'm going to make a business and that business then employs lots of people and they pay tax and it makes widgets that people like. And so it's like a win, win, win sort of thing. Um, and so there's this, um, there's this idea that, that, that these sorts of ideas have been incorporated into public life, that these ideas of competition and market forces have been, have been you know, started to bubble up in, in education, like you say. So we can see this, probably one of the first major ones that that I can think of was the introduction of league tables. Was that under Thatcher? I think it might have been under Thatcher, the introduction of league tables. So so schools are sort of competing with one another. And, you know, there are other things like performance-related pay was brought in in an attempt to sort of, you know, to, 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 I suppose to bring this idea of competition from the school level down to the teacher level, where it's like, you know, you're going to be you're going to be awarded pay incremental pay rises based on whether or not you hit your target grades or not. And so now, you know, if, if a teacher's got some resource that's really helping their kids to understand something, there's now an incentive for them to not share that with their colleagues because they're like, I want my kids to get, you know. So it, you can see how these, these problems arise that actually, you know, it's, it's totally inappropriate to, to introduce, you know, children are not widgets. Like, they, like this is not a widget situation and it's not about productivity and efficiency. Um, that, and that when you introduce these market forces, you end up with lots of quite unethical practices happening where you know, this happened in, in the NHS, for example, when, you know, Blair and they brought in lots of target setting and all of a sudden there was hospitals where they were cutting the wheels off trolleys and redefining them as beds or redefining, um, you know, wards, like corridors as wards so that they could, you know, get their numbers down, say. So as soon as you introduce these top down sort of target driven initiatives, People cut corners to figure out how they can how they can bend the rules, and we've seen we've seen a proliferation of of off rolling and and putting kids on so called guest status um, in schools where where kids who are you know attending the school all, all day are sort of are put on this this legal status which is designed for. Um, you know, for kids who are school refusers or if they're dual placement, say, and they're mainly not at your school so that they're not going to count towards the results. But there was a school that I worked at where that was happening. And, you know, a number of kids were put onto guest status. Obviously, that's outrageous. But but it's because of this incorporation, this like inappropriate incorporation, it seems to me, of these ideas into the educational sphere. Yeah, it, it, it I mean, performance related pay doesn't work wherever it's used, let alone in the in the world of education, where by our very nature, teachers, we, we, we're in it because we want to collaborate. The OECD did some work around teacher motivation and they found that, yeah, money, get, get the money right and, and they're okay. It doesn't have to be a huge amount, but just make it so that they're comfortable. But then actually what helps teachers be motivated is the chance to do interesting projects in a collaborative way. That's the nature of why we chose to do the things that we do, why we go into rooms full of 30 other people, given the chance, pandemics permitting. To, to to because we're we're collaborative by nature. It's not about the competition necessarily. Um, uh, the, the the league table thing, yeah, it 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 builds it builds into the system that we must have people who fail. We must have schools that fail. So it's a it's state condoned um, uh, acceptance that failure in education is part of it. Mm. And it doesn't have to be like that. It's just a model. They're just mental models. Neoliberalism is just a mental model. There are other mental models we could approve. Yeah. That what I noticed in Chile is the extent to which I mean, we talk about the trickle down, the trickle down idea is that if everybody at the top's got loads of money, if if the people at the top have got lots of money, it'll sort of work its way down. Um, and some people sort of take that as a, a sort of received wisdom for the neoliberal approach to the economics. But actually, that 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 reference, it actually, when you look at it, it was a an American performance cowboy comedian 
who was making a joke at the president at the time's expense. And the president, I can't remember his name, he used to be an engineer. And he said, you know, he, he understands water because it always trickles down, but actually money doesn't work that way. And what I saw in Chile is money trickles up. If you're in the poor end of town to go to work, you have to, well, you have to get, you have to get yourself insured. You have to pay for that. That works its way to the top. You, 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 um, you, you get on the, on the privatized trains or whatever. That works its way to the top. You pay for the child to go to the school. So that goes to the top. You, 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 you have to go and get your medicine, which you pay for. So that goes to the top. So it's a trickle up is what's happening. It's a big conveyor belt where the money just goes in, in, in one particular direction. And also you mentioned Adam Smith. I was reading a book recently that it was about um, agnotology and about deliberate, not misinformation, but deliberate ignorance, how we can deliberately decide how people think by the things we don't say rather than the things we do say. And and what this book, uh, the author was suggesting, was saying was that there are, in Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, there are, I think there are, it's a big tome, and something like five different books within it. And the fifth book is the one where he talks about the need for regulation, that if you just let the wealthy in charge of it, it they're just going to line their own nests and, and it's not actually going to be in the in society's interest to, to not have regulation. But what happens, what's happened over the years is various editors have gone, well, this is a big book, we need to sort of edit it. We'll have done a bridge version. Which bit shall we cut? All right, well, we'll lose that chapter. So so by, by, by accident or by deli- deliberate intent, who knows, what's happened is we've got this smaller version, which is probably the one that Margaret Thatcher read, which says it's all about the free market, and they've deliberately missed off the bit where it says you need we need regulation of that. <laughs> so you start to unpick all of this sort of stuff. And I talk when I talk about the, the, like the, my book, The Working Class, and and I'm talking to head teachers and uh, and uh, to this SACT conference a couple of years ago, and I'm trying to say, look, let's start with Chile, <laughs> let's start here. And I know you don't know this sort of stuff. And here's a picture of Pinochet. Here's a picture of Pinochet standing next to Margaret Thatcher because she welcomed him over because of the. Falklands thing because the Chileans were having an argument with the Argentinians, so it sort of was in their interest. Let's let's start to see why we have the mental models we have now, because if we see that, then we can start to challenge those mental models and perhaps put in some better mental mental models. So let's get underneath why, who thought league tables is a good idea? Why why everything's all about the data? I know you. I think you said it earlier, James. You know you can't you can't improve what you can't measure. And we go back to then Michael Barber and his. His performativity stuff, and, the, the, and his, you know, it was full of the spreadsheets which he was sharing with Tony Blair at the time. So it all became about the. Somebody once said to me, you know, the markets need data. How can you improve something? You've got to, you've got to, you, to know something's better than something else, and to allow them to compete, you need to have measurements of that. But that's a model. But there are other models available that we could we could approach. And I think with so many people around the world have been screaming through this pandemic. Now's an opportunity to come up with some new models. Now, mm. so let's review the nature of exams, review the nature of, of, of what makes a school. Is it the building or is it the connection of the people wherever they might be in the world? To review what we mean by the important things to learn, to review the, the most important things that education should be about. Let's, but, but, but that screaming seems to be unheeded by the narrowness of, of politicians who are going, no, I need education to go back in its box. We must do the exams. Or we must do a mini exams. Or we must, it's all about closing the gap. Between what, but who? Where did this gap come from? Who's decided that it's a gap? Who's decided that that, that that is better than that? And if they don't have that, then they're less than that. Let's let's, let's reevaluate it, given all the other stuff that's going on in the world, let alone the, the pandemic. I suppose that's that, that's part of, of what I'm clamouring for and why I'm working with people from all around the world to try and just... I, I say to head teachers when I'm working with them, I, I, I'm not working with you as a school leader, I'm working with you as an educational leader. What are the decisions that we're going to make about the nature of education, teaching, learning in the classroom, but bigger than that as well, uh, together? As because uh, if we don't, if we just focus on data and targets and stuff and, and Ofsted or whatever inspection regime we've got, then other people will be making those bigger decisions about the, the future uh, and, and nature of education. And we should be the ones who have got something to say and not just passively waiting for something to happen to us. I want to get into the rethinking education bit of the conversation. Um, but <laughs> once again, you keep saying really interesting stuff that I want to talk about first. No, it's, it's a good problem to have. So I want to talk about the working class book. 
and also uh, School Differently, this sort of um, fledgling organisation that's starting to, 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 take the, to take these ideas that you were just talking about forward. But first of all, there's this word that you've used a couple of times, agnotology, um, A-G-N-O-T-ology. Um, can you just explain a bit about what that is? Because I've not come across that before. It, it, it's the study of ignorance. Uh, deliberate ignorance. It's it's doing things in such a way where you only give people certain amounts of it of of the information uh, and allow them to use that without and but have deliberately miss it. You've not misinformed. You just you've just not informed them enough. That's part of it. There's also an element of agnotology in, in terms of understanding ignorance uh, and the and the importance of ignorance and not knowing. Which is what in, 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 ignorance is the French ignore means to not to know. It doesn't mean to be stupid. It means just not to know. Mm. So understanding how important ignorance is and that it exists. So it's not all mm. about what we know. It's as much about what we don't know as what we know. This is where you can get frustrated with the, with, with Twitter and the like. Sometimes there's a phrase they use in agnotology, which is if you know if you know a little, you think you know a lot, and and then you go on Twitter. If you know a lot, <laughs> you know you know you know you know a little which is why we get to Professor Sagar, Dimitri and others saying, I don't know, maybe, and, and perhaps. So it's trying to just, just help people realise that, that just because you know stuff doesn't mean to say that there's still not this huge amount of unknown that is important, that we can sort of go towards. And you look at the work of, of scientists, and, and I think Einstein talked about this, that science is like, a little, is like a little speck of light in a dark room, and all we're doing is just sort of making the, the spec grow a little bit, but the stuff around the edges is still incredibly important and useful and relevant. And if we're thinking, yep, yeah, that's it, it is known. Education is known, teaching is known. We know how to do it now, full stop. There is no darkness in the room anymore. Then we are going to come a cropper and we're also doing ourselves a disservice and we're deprofessionalizing the profession. This is what I've seen with all the focus about the what works and the research and you must do it like this and you must do what they say and you can't, you know, this inability to think for yourself, to, to innovate. I talked about being a... Um, uh, an inventor and, and one of my favorite um, um education writers is a uh, um uh, Bista or Biesta Bista I think it's pronounced yeah. um you know the, the the beautiful risk of teaching I love that book it's a very very deep and profound book but it, it's this idea that teaching is a it's a risk you don't know you can't predict you can't say with absolute scientific certainty if I do a b will happen because it might not it might do but it might not and even if it does happen it might not have been because of a so, so there is a risk, but it's the beautiful risk. That's what makes teaching exciting, that we, I'll try this and we'll see what happens. And it might work, it might not, but we're still going to learn something like your, like your P4C master stuff. I'm still going to learn stuff, and it might have been not what I set out to learn. Um, I, I saw um, uh, uh, a reference in a book, it was an encyclopedia about um, teaching and learning, I think a Routledge book, I think. And it was some guy from Durham University talking about... Um, the need for teachers to think for themselves and the, and the way in which they were pilloried for I've done learning styles or I've done brain gym. And what he's saying is that teachers aren't stupid. They, they didn't just do something that didn't work and carried on doing it because they were stupid. They did something that, that might not have had the claims that it had, like, for example, brain gym, but some benefit was happening anyway, which is the one that they hung on to. And I remember talking to one of our associates, Dr. Andrew Curran, about the use of water, drinking water. Suddenly everybody was like, you have to drink water in the classroom, otherwise they spontaneously combust in the middle of literacy hour. And I was saying, you know, where's, is there any research about learning and water and everything? And he was saying, no, there is no proper scientific peer-reviewed evidence that says water improves. He says, by the time the water has reached their brains, they've left the lesson anyway. But teachers were talking about the benefits of drinking water in the classroom. And he was saying, maybe it's to do with dopamine. You know, the, the, the reward chemical, you get a reward, you get dopamine from having a reward or the anticipation reward. Having a sip on a hot day of some cool water makes you feel good. Dopamine improves our memory. So, so maybe it wasn't, oh, yeah, water plumps up the brain because that's rubbish. But actually, by having water, it, it, it just makes them feel better and being in the classroom. And that feel good chemicals improve our memory. Or maybe I've got a sense of control because I don't have to have my hand up and wait for the teacher to let me go out to the toilet to get a drink. I can just sort of, in my own time, just have a little sip. Mm. So it's, 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 it's having this understanding that there are lots of other things. You, you, you do A and B happens, but there's, all, there's other things going on as well. And, and that's OK. And, and we don't know what they are until we try it, as opposed to you must do this because that's the only thing that will that will, that will cause learning to happen. And it's we, it, we, we limit and we deprofessionalize. And, and Biesta says the same sort of thing, the extent to which we're deprofessionalized. He talks about the gift of teaching. Yeah. You know, he says, he says, you know, we shouldn't be facilitators. Facilitate, facile, facilidad. It means to make easy. Don't make learning easy. We know that if it's hard, 
they have to think about it. It's better, it sticks better. Don't make it easy for them, the last thing we need. And the gift of teaching is this, it's this thing that you as the teacher, this unique thing, this convergence of you and your experience, your knowledge, your subject knowledge, your knowledge of the kids, the children, the community, the time, the, the weather, the everything, all at that precise point. And that, that the gift of teaching is a thing that we can bring, that the robots can't bring, that Google can't bring, but that is more than just the, 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 the facilitation or the delivery of, or the delivery of knowledge. So yes. I, and I just, we need to re-empower teachers to 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 experiment and think for themselves and and share and and just not be scared and there's a lot of scared a lot of tired teachers understandably but there's a there's a fear that's been brought in by the current regime of doing it wrong and back to the bitchiness being pilloried and 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 the, the, and and how dare you think that that could have been the silver bullet you should be doing it like this and it's just it it, it limits us it limits humanity yeah and and I do think that, you know, we talked about the dark side of, of Twitter and online stuff earlier, but there's so much really good stuff happening online, largely enabled by Twitter and by teachers blogging and the proliferation of books that teachers have been writing recently. And it does feel like a profession that is becoming empowered far more so than it was, um, you know, five or 10 years ago. Um, and, and long may that last. And it, and I think that, um, there's a, there's, there are many reasons to be, to be quite optimistic about that. Um, and, and I love that phrase that, that, that teaching is a gift and it's often, you know, it's, it might seem like a bit of a tre- cliche or a bit trite to sort of say, oh, like it's such a privilege to be a teacher and it's the best job in the world and all that. But it really is like, it's, it's an unbelievable privilege to have the, to, to, to play such a pivotal role in, in so many young people's lives, or at least a, what is potentially a pivotal role and the power that teachers have to change lives that irreversibly um, for the better is is unbelievable. And, and it, especially as that relates, in my view, I think that oracy is the number one place that we can focus our efforts. If, we, if teachers could get behind the um, the programme for oracy, regard, I mean, this is something that, funnily enough, that, that Nick Gibb and, and his acolytes nobody's arguing against the idea that we want young people to be articulate like this is not something this is something that you know people on both sides of the aisle seem to be united around um <clears throat> but you know oracy is taken very seriously in in the private school you know system you know they take it extremely seriously and for a whole range of reasons it's been underplayed and undervalued partly because it's hard to measure like partly it's just like a technical problem like it's hard to measure it doesn't leave a paper trail like spoken language is ephemeral it disappears it fades and this you know and and that hence the the dreaded bloody verbal feedback stamp that has been doing the rounds that people want to somehow turn to turn spoken language into a into a paper trail um but i can't think of of a more powerful way or a more effective way of leveling the playing field if if we can help every single kid regardless of their background or wealth or whatever it might be to to have the same type level of not the same to speak in the same way as people who leave from you know like the harrows and rugby's and oxbridge you know schools of this world um but um to have that confidence and that that sort of that sense of just like i i my I, my voice is is um something that I will use to get things done. Like spoken language is a tool for getting things done, and that, and to be able to code switch, for example, to be able to speak differently in different situations. Um, if we can help every kid to develop that ability, and and it's actually not that difficult to do, I can't think of a more powerful thing that that teachers could do to to not just to empower individuals, but actually to really level the playing field in terms of society and in terms of the, the whole idea of, demo, of of democratic participation, you know, that if people are feeling empowered to have their voice heard and they know how to do that and how to express it and how to speak to different audiences, get their points across, it's an unbelievable amount of power that teachers have. Um, which, which I think brings us on uh, a little bit, at least, to the to the working class book that you mentioned earlier. Uh, this was a compendium, wasn't it? That was there were, there were many different people who wrote wrote chapters in there. Um, but w- is there a sort of an overarching theme? Would you say what would you say is the sort of the, the thrust of that book? 
this 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 is the book. <laughs> Sorry, it's got, I think it's going to be in reverse for you because of the way my camera's set up. But it's it's a big thick tome. I I was fed up again the experiences in Chile and realizing that there was this this neoliberal mindset and narrative was out there about the feckless poor that, that there was a level playing field we just give every child the same opportunities and some will rise to the top and some won't and it will be their own fault and say it's, it's but it's that's not true it, it just isn't true there are so many other ways that we need to think about how we um uh, appreciate support help work with children from poorer backgrounds so i just put out a call via twitter via um and, and also just to highlight something else you said about twitter there's some fantastic stuff i think i independent thinking account i think we just block five people and everything else is is, is wonderful now so it, it's it, use of the block or the mute uh, makes twitter a really wonderful place it's really good and um, so i put out on twitter and via our blog just to call and to the associates within independent thinking but to anybody i want to write a book i want to bring together a book different voices that have this alternative narrative about what it is to get the best out of working with people from poorer backgrounds and it was as simple as that and we had um I think there's about 50 different contributors. We've got people from university represented. We've got a lot of the associates talking sort of first-hand experience. Uh, we've got people who, who I haven't met who I've just sort of come, at, come, come across in this process who have written. And all I did then as an editor was just sort of interweave. I, I brought in the research between each of these different chapters and sort of interwove all the chapters together so it makes one coherent whole. Um, and, and I'm incredibly proud of the book because it does exactly what we we said it wanted to do. It's it's here are some alternative narratives. Here are some other ways of looking at it. So so when you've got people like Toby Young saying oh, it's a level playing field, we'll, we'll give every children the same chance. You think well, it's not because here's the research about uh, the neurology of poverty. Here's the research about what happens in the develop in, in the womb of the children when the parents are in poverty. Here is the research economically about it. The the amount the grandparents earned will have a direct impact on the amount that grandchildren go on to earn in later life. Here's the research about grammar schools and how they weren't this amazing golden age. Actually, all they did was just a bit like my experience at Durham University. They just made some of the poor kids who were a bit clever feel bad a lot of the time. <laughs> they're, 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 and when, and when none of it was saying, you must think like this, it's uh, independent thinking is, as its name suggests, it's saying, here are some alternatives. Here are some other ways of thinking about it. You've still got to draw your own conclusions. But there is, the, the phrase we keep coming back to is that there is another way. And that's what I wanted to do with, with, with the, the working class book and, and look at you know, things like diet and things like um, air pollution. There's been a lot recently about air pollution in um, uh, the, the people living in the poor end of town are the ones with the most pollution and the pollution has a direct impact on health and, and on neurological development. So to say all five-year-olds are the same is, is not true. It also, we can challenge the views around genetics and geneticism, um, which, and I know this government has its, you know, it's, it's tried to sort of introduce that directly and um, got kicked out and, and but they're, maybe they're working under, underneath the, the, the radar with that this idea that some people are born clever and they just happen to be the wealthy ones and we know that mm. we and, and i in my google book i challenged that as well you know the the 11 plus um came to be because the government wanted this work, way of working out which are the clever ones that we can work out at 11 that will go into grammar school and which are the ones that can go to sort of secondary modern technical education so, so cyril burt uh, identi suggested who was a geneticist who was a member of the eugenics society which has now become the uh, galton society so exists um that you could you know put a test together by about the age of 11 you could work out if that were the case and so these models still sort of persist even though we know that genetics plays a part but not the most important part there are so many other factors at, at, at play as well so i was just trying to say to people look before you decide if you're working with children from poorer backgrounds this is what you must do here are some other things to think about around pride around shame this is where we meant you to talk about Brené Brown she's sort of referenced in the book as well um that research from I think it was from the Netherlands they found that because uh, I think Gove was quoted and he's in the book quoted as saying you know we just need a colorblind education system it doesn't see color but the research shows that around around um, ethnicity and around poverty if you pretend it doesn't exist it, it's it's not a good thing if you identify and value it and value difference and allow people to talk about who they are and where they're from and what they bring then that is a way of actually closing the gap or bringing helping more people feel more successful in the classroom um, yeah. i also in, interweave that book with a uh, with a short book that i came across a few years ago um, which was written by a load of italian school children with the help of their teacher um, and they were these were poor children and they were saying you know it's like a dear teacher book you you think you're trying to help me but you're making it worse 
you 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 know what the most damage you can do to me it's not the stick it's the pen when you mark in the book that i've failed that's the thing that stays with me the bruises disappear you 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 think you're trying to introduce me into your culture but you're dismissing my culture my culture may not be your culture but it's still our culture so i'm just trying to open up the the the, the narratives and the dialogue and the discussions and the change in the mental mo- and show that there are different mental models when it comes to working with children from from poorer backgrounds and i know that book has has hit home with with it's a big book for anybody to sort of sit and read but i know it's transformed people's approaches to to to, to education and working with children from poorer backgrounds so it's I, i'm it's a book i'm proud of and and it's one that's drawn from not from my experience uh, middle class i'm not saying that but there's a lot of experience as well as the research Mm -hmm. as well as uh, academic study and it comes it grew out of that 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 chilling experience of just seeing poverty and seeing how it's built into the system and that maybe we can uh, it's built into the system and then we blame the poor people for the system that isn't of their doing and that we can do something about it and you see it now you see it with the debates around free school meals in england you know parents should be able to feed their own children it's like there's more to it than all, than all of that yeah yeah um and i know that so the, the, the you've sort of um, put together like there's these top 10 truths that sort of summarize some of the themes from the book and one of them is that the purpose of education is not to make everyone middle class and that's a that's an important one i think because it seems like that is often the the narratives that are around you know that the professions that are valued and that if you're good at you know school that you could go on and and, and attain one of what is you know considered to be the middle class professions of you know sort of doctors and and lawyers and accountancy and and so on and and even just the going to university is the aim of of education um and that doesn't seem to be necessarily a healthy way of seeing things in the conversation the, the first episode of this podcast that i had with with Debbie Kidd, who I know you know well, um, she was talking about how that narrative leads to just like an exodus of of, of talent from local communities. That, that the idea being that if you're good at education, that that's your ticket out of here. You know, you need to somehow go away, and we need to have narratives that are about helping you know successful, intelligent people and from all kinds of walks of life to start thinking about you know how they can take their place and shape their their local communities. We, we have the phrase social mobility and it's just if you don't think about it you just think it, oh that, that that's a good thing social mobility it's just in the sentence yes that's a, that's the thing we're going to work towards and it was in writing the book one of another of our associates david cameron real david cameron from scotland was saying social mobility means that you have to 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 achieve and, and debbie echoes this you achieve you have to have left and what that also means is the place you grew up in has no value and will yeah. will get worse so by saying Social mobility, that's a good thing. What we're saying is certain communities we can just cut adrift and forget about. And that only other only certain sorts of communities are the ones that are worthy of, of, of getting into. So and you suddenly think, well, I never I hadn't thought of it like that. And, and suddenly you realize that we now need to interrogate the language that is being used and what we mean by it, and not just take it face value that yes, we're we're all about social mobility. Well, what does that mean? What does that look like? What are the implications of that what are the unintended consequent matter complexity unintended consequences of we're all in for social mobility and i think you know david cameron and then debbie's work as well debbie in the book talks about being pulled up by the roots and sent somewhere where it's rather just let's let's feed the roots and and and, and if we choose to not that you'd have to stay there but if we choose to to stay where we are and make the where we are better we work with a charity a children's charity in a sort of manchester way called reclaim and they were they were all about that why do we have to leave somewhere to be better why can't we just make here better and that they were very powerful student voices young people's voices uh great great work around oracy as well we, we did a conference there we had um uh, um mayor of london what's it called they've been in the news mayor of mayor of manchester greater manchester andrew burnham uh, yes andy burnham so he came and spoke and they had they had worked with him and they had managed to persuade him to get um free bus passes for all 16 to 18 year olds across greater manchester because they were arguing that, you know, if we wanted to go to college, we have to get on a bus and go to college. We can't afford that. Our parents can't afford that. Therefore, we are being limited in our education, not because of our intelligence, but because of because of economics. Um, but in future life, it was like, oh, you didn't go to college, therefore you're not as clever as that person. But but there were reasons for that, which were linked to society and fairness and e- economics. And so they'd, they'd managed to persuade um, 16 to 18 year olds to get bus passes across Greater Manchester to go to and go to interviews as well. So 
and so much of it comes back to complexity. There's, there's so it's so intricate, and we need mm. to see the interrelationedness of these things. And and uh, we can't solve it all, but we can understand it better and stop blaming and shaming. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the, a lot of the work that I've been doing in recent years has been this, around this idea of complex interventions, which are very commonly understood in other fields, in medicine, in healthcare, in social work, in psychotherapy. Complex interventions are widely understood, which is just that, you know, if you want to fix something, it, it's often an idea to have a solution that's made of multiple problems, so multiple elements. And it's sort of based a bit on the idea of marginal gains theory, that the individual elements sort of stack up and interact and you get this sort of bigger effect size overall um and it seems to me that you know lots like you say lots of these these issues that we're talking about are complex they're really complex it involves societal factors economic factors education is emotional um and almost like spiritual as as as, as much as it is um as like a cognitive endeavor um and so if we want to if we want to to think about how to make things better and how education can be an engine for for and you know th- th- even that question that sort of people on the progressive side of the aisle, as it were, um, would sort of argue that that education is is a, to some extent about social engineering. That you know that if we had if we had a different education system, we would see a different world. And other people think that that's just like you know that that progressives are getting ideas above their station at that point, and that actually your job isn't to do social engineering. And you know you tick tick a box once every five years, and you know if you don't like the social engineers at the top of the system, you can vote for a new lot. Um, but that seems to overlook the fact that you're doing social engineering anyway. <laughs> like, like schools, schools are engineering the way that the world is anyway and the world doesn't seem to be going too well you know it's a scary place out there at the moment and there's very very deep rooted problems that nobody has got an easy solution to uh, and that nobody really knows how to break make this stop and i think that as you say embracing this idea of complexity and recognizing that complex problems require complex solutions i think is the first step towards you know getting making some headway I think there's there's a part of it as well as a phrase that came into my reading the Vesta book, The Beautiful Risk of Education, about throwing children out of the cave we're in. So us adults now, this is our world. It's very hard for us to envisage a world that is different from this. Um, but we do need a world that's different from this because the, the world isn't, isn't going to survive. I, in my Google book, I talked about, I borrowed the work of a guy called James Martin who'd written about the number of... Um, significant challenges facing the world things like uh, forced migration lack of water climate change um he also talked about um worldwide global pandemic the challenge with that and i wrote about that in the global in the, in the in my google book that we need an education system that prepares young children to deal with a global pandemic which is what we've discovered we do we we we, we do need that so um this idea of throwing children out the cave we're in is we're not going to change as adults we're not going to change our world because we can't really see what we've got we just we see the outer part of it but it's so embedded into our thinking about what what is and what isn't and how it is and how it isn't but if that's if we keep children in the cave with us and just prepare them to be in our world then nothing will change and if 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 things don't change things die we know we know that's basic sort of basic science is why we talked mm-hmm. about this earlier you know progressives at least it's got the word progress in it it's, it, things need to change things need to move forward they don't always go in the right direction but movement is an important part of it stay, stay staying put is, is is death for all organisms um including um viruses um including covid mm-hmm. um um so so but if the education is is what we're doing is actually preparing them and then throwing them out of our cave for, so they can create their own cave, which is different from ours. Then, then I think that's then we're working towards something a lot more noble in the world of education, not preparing them for success in our world, but preparing them to create their own world. So, we, but we, which we'll never see and never be part of because we're in yeah. that cave. So we throw we throw them out of the cave that we will never leave. I like it. It's a it's a strong analogy, and I also like how you talk about mental models because that's what we're dealing with here. And actually, it makes it seem quite light somehow that, that actually, you know, you can throw off a mental model and just sort of see things in a different way and realise that you, you you sort of somehow, you can become imprisoned by ideas and not realise. You, you know that in the film V for Vendetta, when uh, Natalie Portman's character is like, in, she finds herself in a prison and, and the guy with the mask shaves her head off and she's in this prison cell and she's being tortured and the door was open all along. She 
could have walked out at any point, but she just didn't even think to try the, to try the door handle, you know, because it looked like a prison, and so she sort of stayed in there. And I often think that that's sort of, you know, a, a pretty neat analogy. And that also the idea of the panopticon, you know, the idea of a, of a the Jeremy Bentham's idea of a prison where the guard can see all the prisoners, but the prisoners can't see the guard. That seems to be a pretty good metaphor for how Ofsted works, right? That like Ofsted comes around once every five years for two days you know and it's actually not that bad like there's a lot of fear that goes into it you know but um it's not that bad when they come you know even when you get a bruising off stead you're like that wasn't that bad you know they've still got a job you know i still coming to work every day nothing's really changed you've changed the label of the school from from ri to good or to whatever but really nothing's fundamentally changed um but in between those five years, teachers are policing one another relentlessly as though we're sort of continually being watched and we're observing each other. And, you know, my goodness, I heard examples recently of, of schools that are doing online observations of teachers in the first two weeks of 2021 when we're under such intense strain. And that's a mental model, this idea that we need to scrutinise and look at one another and that we need to hold one another to account and that that's what good looks like. That's just an idea that we have. And we can just silently drop that idea and, and, and try some other ideas on for size. Um, and especially this idea that I really think that it's a good place to start. And I know I keep coming back to it, but it's just because it's such a burning injustice. The idea that one third must fail, like the impact that that has on those young people. I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Diane Ray. She wrote a brilliant book. She's a Cambridge professor. She wrote a brilliant book called Miseducation, which at least partly talks about the impact that that word failure has on, on young people and what they think of themselves and what they think that they can go on to do with their lives. Like it's just outrageous. And there are some people who think that we need that, that you need to have some some failure in order for the successes to mean something. They genuinely think that. Um, but it doesn't take very long to actually think your way out of that mental model and to think, well, you know, I'm, I'm rubbish at all kinds of things, but I don't need to fail an exam at those things in order to recognise that other people are good at those things. Um, and we could we could adopt different different models. And at, like you say, at this point in time, you know, post soon to be post pandemic, goodness, hopefully soon to be post pandemic, um, there are lots of people who are taking this as an opportunity to think actually maybe this isn't right maybe there's maybe there's a way to do things very differently and that's not just in terms of remote learning or blended learning or whatever um and I want to come on to School Differently, which I know is an organisation that you're sort of uh, involved in. But I think that it might make sense to come to come back to that later on, because I want to want to move to the to the rethinking education part of this conversation. And we've already sort of done quite a bit of that already. But essentially, there's three there's three broad questions that I'll ask. And we'll do it as a fairly sort of quick fire round because we've been we've been talking for a little while now. Um, and it, it's like, what are the positives that you see? Like, what do you see that's happening out in the world? And this could be globally, it could be, you know, in terms of some local school down the road, it could be a thing that you saw a teacher do. But just like, what, what do you think is really good that's happening out there that you want to see more of or, or boost the signal of? Um, the second one is what what do you see as the major challenges that we face as as educators um, or as as you know human beings, uh, and the third one is what can we do about those challenges? And I, so I want to end on you know some ideas for how we can how we can fix this almighty pickle that we seem to have gotten ourselves into. So let's start with the positives. Yeah, I see some of in in. The UK, I see some of the best teachers in the world. Um, they are highly sought after both as teachers and as school leaders all over the world for their, not only their creativity when it comes to teaching and learning and their focus on teaching and learning as going beyond the delivery like my girls had when they were at school in Chile, but also for the love and the compare and the compassion that they bring to education that that we take as grant for granted because we have PSHE and we have tutor groups and in locus parentis and all of those sorts of things. We just think that's the way we do education in the UK. But there are many countries where there is no obligation for any of that level of care beyond just turning up, delivering a lesson and going back and sitting in the cafe again. That's not a criticism of the French system. That's just saying, or well, the Dutch system, but that's, that's how they operate. Do you, do you want to say something, James? Sorry. Uh, yeah, can we? Can you name some of those? I don't know what what the opposite of naming and shaming is, but are there any people that you that, that you that you have in mind where you that you think like that we've got some really innovative practice happening? I, I mean, it, it, 
at the moment I'm t thinking in terms of just the, just the general level of teaching of the teaching professional in the right. UK. Okay. That that it, I can I can see and, and I know that there are many many teachers in this country, in the UK who would easily walk into a job anywhere in the world and be one of the top teachers in that school because of the things that I was saying in terms of their the understanding of teaching and learning, um, and they're also that level of care and compassion that they bring that you don't you just don't have to have those in order to be a teacher in a French school or a Dutch school or other schools as well because that's not what's expected of them that's not the job that they do right so I. I, and, and in terms of the school leadership as well, there, there's an element of oh, we've got an English male, white, middle class man as our school head teacher in whatever other side of the world. Therefore, it's sort of good for good for the kudos of the school and good for marketing. And there's more to great school leadership from this country than just the white males, if you like. But the, but the level of leadership on the whole that the UK generates um, the level of thought, the level of, of yeah, genuine educational leadership is is highly sought after. And again, it's, it's not something that is uh, uh, so many parts around the world. The, the, the head teacher is the, admin, the the chief administrator, the the man or woman who just makes sure there are enough pencils and chairs and paper. That's that's their role. That's their job. It's not criticism. That is the role of the head teacher. And other people set the tone, whereas we uh, the, the school leaders have a genuine sense of educational leadership that can be encouraged. And I think in the UK, we need to value that. But at the, on the other hand, not to become arrogant, because what you also get around the world is the teacher from England who just said, well, I'm just going to do it the English way because that's the best way. You know, And then the Harry Potter sort of thing kicks in as well. So this, there are there is good stuff going on around the world that you won't find in an English system. Uh, I'm, I'll separate England from Wales because Wales and Scottish um, curriculum are going in sort of different directions and, and going in a way that the rest, so many schools would actually appreciate. And, and when you mentioned where, the way England is going in terms of its curriculum and pedagogy, they, a lot of people around the world in my experience that I've met have, have just sort of been bemused as to why we would travel in, in a way that they see as backwards where we had the creativity and the flexibility and the openness and the, the thinking. And, and then we sort of, we've got rid of that in order to do what we're doing now in England. Whereas Wales is, Wales looked to Scotland, Scotland looks to Scandinavia. Many people look to Scandinavia within the international sector. You've got the international baccalaureate, which is still very knowledge heavy, but at least they do allow the opportunity to do inquiry based and knowledge, uh, um, inquiry based and um, sort of more curiosity based work. Now you mentioned inquiry based learning on Twitter and uh, where's the proof that, they, that that works. It, it depends what you what you're measuring is what works now if you want the most efficient way of passing exams it isn't but if you want a broader education then then i've seen great examples of of where it is you've also got things i've seen over the years um like coming out of mexico i think um la escuela nueva which is uh, um, just taking the primary school model and just get the, rather than sitting in rows, they're sitting in circles. They work in a more collaborative, creative sort of way. Um, I'm a big mm. fan of El Sistema in um, um, Venezuela, where it grew out of, the, of that work of, the, of giving poor children access to the arts, uh, as, as well as children with special needs. What's the phrase they use? You know, the, the, the soul does not have special needs. Everybody has access Everybody's the ability to create Love wonderful it. music and the ability to access uh, wonderful music. So you look at the, you look at those sorts of ways of working, if you like. That, are, that, that there's there's great practice going on. So we have great teachers in this country, and there is great practice going on all around the world, and not just in the wealthier schools. In fact, some of the worst practice can can be in the wealthier schools. Um, there's a, it's a, one of the, 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 the sort of, it's not a thunk if you like, but it's a, a, just a, just something to get people thinking. Is you know, can the best schools have the worst results, and vice versa? So, so, so there's, there are many, many positives, um, and and this, you know, the government in this country should look at its teachers and go, we need to release them, release the power and the energy and the creativity and the compassion and the love that they've got, and not limit them and pick on them and make them feel bad and useless and all of those sorts of things. So, so that 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 can change in this country, but for teachers from this country and head teachers, just know that you are among the best in the world. Second question was. Challenges. Um, ultimately, it, it's all down to climate change because everything else is a waste of time and effort unless we address the issue of climate change. And, and look at interconnectivity. Uh, one of our associates, Professor uh, Paul Clark, uh, does a lot of work around environment in, at, at governmental level globally. He's also um, you know, been privy to um, the uh, global panel on climate change. And I remember meeting him in Hong Kong once. He'd just come from a, one of those global panel on climate change meetings quite despondent 
about how things were accelerating and things were getting worse and the extent to which we're not on the edge of a cliff, we're actually over the cliff. We're in that little bit where we're sort of, you know, spinning in midair before we... Wily Coyote. That's the one, yeah. Uh, and he was saying, and, and we were talking about that and talked about migration. And it was at the time where there was like, you know, all the all the, the hordes are coming across Europe and trying to get into, into Britain. And, and, and that's linked to climate change as well as other things, but it's linked to climate change. And he was saying, what... You know, we haven't. Europe hasn't got a policy for that. What's going to happen when Spain and France get too hot to live in? What's what are we going to do? What's our plan? What's the policy? Do are we all going to trans, are we all going to move north? So many species are moving north. Whether it's plants, trees are moving north. The fish are moving. The people are, 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 are moving. So what happens? And and um, my daughter was an old pair in. Um, Northern Spain, uh, I can't what it's called now, but in Northern Spain, when, when they were experiencing some of the hottest temperatures they'd ever have, and it was, it was unbearable. They don't have air conditioning, but if you have air conditioning like in Dubai, you're only adding to it anyway. And also you've yeah. got the point in, in the Middle East where the, <coughs> where the buildings the buildings there are at their limit of what air conditioning can do. So then what do you do? Well, you build under the sea, which is where we're putting a lot of the, um, the new build um, cloud, you know, the, the computer power. So Microsoft have got a big undersea um we talk about stuff being in the cloud. It's not. It's it's in these big server farms, <laughs> which generate so much heat. So how do yeah. what do we do about that? We put them un- underwater again. Back to interconnectivity and 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 seeing more of and, and seeing really what the what the issues are. So <clears throat> if we don't address climate change and all the other things that come away come with that, then um, then we're going to be in trouble. One of the benefits of addressing climate change and understanding the environment and being in the environment is it has the benefits for for um, mental health. So we've got a we've got a challenge there around mental health, but if we link those two together, then um, that then we've it's two for the price of one. I suggest with that. Can you talk me through that? How how can we tie the how can we tie mental health in, with the environmental uh, agenda? We know not only for adults but for young people as well that the more time we spend outside, interacting in the natural environments, green environments. I remember having a Twitter spat with some people who shall remain nameless because i'd written somewhere about the benefits of green environments but the research shows that when we i think maybe you thought i meant green paint i don't know um but when we are, are exposed to natural i'm looking around because i'm in wales at the moment, looking out at trees and greenery and uh, when we're exposed to that it, it improves our mood it improves our well-being it improves our ability to learn it improves all sorts of things it, it's beneficial for in a medical yeah. way as well if you have um access to natural environment through the window post-op you 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 recover better than if you don't have such things so we're natural creatures we do the the lighting fluorescent lighting flashes on and off or whatever it is how many times a second whereas we know if we're under full spectrum natural lighting that's what we're used to that's what we how we react better that's how we are just better in ourselves rather than suddenly we've got a headache or we're feeling stressed and we don't know why but actually it's because these fluorescent lights have been causing us to create cortisol which is a which is a stress hormone so there's so much research that just being outside, being in the green, interacting with nature, and, and people have found that in the pandemic, the extent to which by just going out for little walks and suddenly they're seeing the birds and the and the plants and the growth and the changing of the seasons and, it, and just how that's been one of the most positive things of these last 12 months worth of, of, of hell that we've been going through. Mm. So, so a direct link between the natural world and 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 well-being. What we also know in terms of happiness is if we if we're just inquisitive, if we just I'm going to be happy because I'm going to get, have a new iPhone or a new pair of trainers. That happiness lasts very briefly, and then we go back to how we were. There's a different sort of had happiness, which is relates more around sort of human flourishing, and the, one of the ways of getting that is to be part of something bigger than we are to contribute to something to make the world better than it was as a result of our interventions by doing those sorts of things it makes us happier so to what extent are we preparing young people to to address the issues to be in the environment to do the things that the society that the communities need and and uh, in a way that there are wins all around Muhammad Yunus the guy who talked who talked about um from Bangladesh, he talked about microcredit, won the Nobel Prize for that. He, he talks about, the, I think it's the three zero, zero unemployment, zero poverty, zero pollution. And in the book, he talks about the need for education to generate not only job seekers, but job, uh, job creators. That we've got intelligent, creative, resourceful young people, and we've got problems in their communities that need to be fixed. And let's put the two together rather than the social mobility, they go to university, they leave and they go become an accountant somewhere. Let's let's set up an education system where the young people are developing 
are addressing the, the needs of the community there and then on, in their doorstep. And then there is research that found that not only do people benefit in terms of well-being by addressing those sort of local community needs, those local community uh, organisations generate more jobs than, going, than, than the big companies do anyway. So, so there are so many wins if we just change the mental model and start coming at things in different sorts of ways. Yeah, yeah. And so do you see, do you see I agree with you that um, obviously climate change is the number one thing. Um, and to, to sort of to bring it back to education, um, or maybe, I don't know, like, to, to what extent is education a potential part of that solution? Or is it like, is it, you know, there's that famous line about, you know, because when Greta Thunberg, what like, you know, people, there's lots of people, it seems from the right of politics, coincidentally, um, like to, to great exception to her doing what she was doing. And they were saying, you should be in school. If you really care about the environment, be in school you know, and study biology and then become an ecologist or whatever, if this is what you want. And she was like, well, there's going to be no planet for me to look after if I go. She was like, I'd love to do that, but that's that, that's not going to work as a long-term strategy. Um, and so, like it's like you say, I mean, I, I, it's it's very graphic, the, the image of Wiley Coyote, because he's got like a split second to get back on the cliff or else, you know, we all know what happens next. Um, and um, it's obviously a massive you know i'm not asking you to fix climate change you know in this podcast because it's a hugely problematic like you say it's a complicated thing but it seems like maybe education is the thing that needs to change because because it's only when enough people become aware of something and become animated enough about that that they actually start to do something about it that that people in positions of power will will take heed as, as for the time being as long as they're in the in the um you know there are people with very very strong interest in maintaining the status quo like you say lots of energy is put into maintaining the status quo um and you know there are big companies um all companies big multinational companies that benefit very nicely thank you very much from the way that things are um I mean, my goodness, I don't even know how to put a question mark on the end of this. Like, um, how do you how do you fix that? <laughs> I, I think it comes back to some of the things we've touched on, uh, and especially around complexity that we have an education system. That is, so two things: one is it 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 talks, it, it builds into the curriculum the challenge that we're facing, and the need to to make changes to do something to to perceive a different reality a different community a different way of working a different way of traveling a different way of being that will that will help to solve help to reduce the the, the impact that, that we're having um, i came across i'm a member of the rspb and i love their work they're quite campaigning and, I, and I, they were referencing some of the work that young people were doing Simon Barnes was writing those recent uh, their magazines and uh, how the young people are just just they're trying to take things into their own hands and there's a group and I can't remember what they're called I made contact with them teaching future or teaching the future and they're just saying we demand we demand a curriculum that addresses climate change you're not teaching us about climate change and you must so they're, they're a campaigning group of young people uh, and a collaborative because I think there's a few organizations involved in that who are campaigning and petitioning government and I imagine on deaf, deaf Nick Gibbs to say we demand that climate change is part of the national curriculum because we need to know about it because we've got to deal with it so so I think it, it needs to be back on we need to be talking about it we need to see the interconnectivity between it and all the subjects that we're talking about in within the school we don't we don't have to get rid of the subjects that we've got that's the way we want to go forward although Finland has got rid of subjects um, but we need to integrate it into uh, the, the, the curriculum. And then the other thing we need to do is to prepare children uh, to, to, to deal with that world where it's happened. So what do you do when France and Spain get too hot to live in? How do you deal with forced migration? How do you deal with um, species loss? What's going on in terms of trying to save species or, and, and zoos or seed banks? Or you know, th the world will have changed. So how, what are we going to do about it? How are we going to live in that world where air conditioning won't work anymore yeah. or where conflict will happen more because we, they think it's about religion because that's what they're telling the world, but actually it's about who owns the wells. So how am I going to deal with those sorts of worlds, which is what I was sort of trying to get to in the Google book, or what I was getting to in the Google book, how are we preparing children for this world that has fundamentally changed and become more challenging and more dangerous in many ways? 
Yes. Yeah, that's really interesting. And and the, the, this idea that, you know, that the young people are demanding to be taught about climate change. And, and you know, I, I suppose that some people might respond to that and say, we, we do, you know, like it's in the science curriculum, it's in geography. But um, having been a science teacher, it's it's not like at least when I was teaching science, it was not gone into in any great depth at all. We weren't talking about rewilding. We weren't talking about potential solutions. We weren't talking about, you know, what people can do. It was like a two but it was like a two mark question on the exam. Um, and and it's almost like they're demanding to be given the tools that they need to get out of that cave that you were mentioning earlier. They're just like, just they tell us what we need to know. Um, so, so let's end on education and what we can do as educators differently. And maybe this would be a good time to, to talk about school differently um, and, and the Square Pegs book that, that you've got coming out. Um, what's that all about? Well, interestingly, I've actually got the people from School Differently waiting for me now because thinking that I'm about to join a Zoom. So we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up with it, if that's okay. Okay. Yeah, um, uh, but we can come back if you want, if there are other things that you want to want to cover. Then I'm more than happy we can sort of reconvene and and, and edit it and come back if you want to talk about some of the other stuff. Okay, but, uh, right. uh, they'll be worried that I'm, we we're about to do a pitch to a, a television production company about some of the stuff we want to see improve with the world of education. School differently. So, school differently. Um, I, I'm a great believer through my work personally and through independent thinking of collaboration and just working with empowering finding as many people as possible who think different things who think there is another way when it comes to education and, and trying to help them have a platform whether it's through speaking or online or through the books to 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 just reinforce this idea that there is another way when it comes to education education is failing a lot of people uh, and um, i was introduced to fran morgan sure she made contact with us who um, runs square pegs uh, and I was opened up to the oh, a massive world of school refusers, uh, just the young people who are out of school because they just don't want to be there. And and in my head, it was like, well, that, that's the choice they make. You ask them why they don't want to be there. And and what you realise is a lot of them they they can't say it. They can't they can't tell you why they don't want to be there. And there are issues around mental health. There are issues around forced exclusion. Anyway, there are issues around bullying. There are issues around um uh just well-being concern issues and you've also got issues around parents who just want something better what they perceive to be better for their children so the home there's a homeschooling movement as well and, and and fran opened my eyes to this whole world just on the periphery of the education system who are just trying to get by and get an education and and we we know they have a moral obligation in any country to educate all its children not just the ones who fit the boxes all its children, but also um, if you look at the, you know, the, the United Nations Convention on Children's Rights, that we, uh, which the English uh, um, education system has to have regard to when it composes, when it creates laws, um, it, it's about finding the potential and bringing it out in every child. Not we need to get this child to do maths and English and science, but actually, what is the potential? What does this child bring? Which I, mean, I mentioned multiple intelligences earlier. What I loved about that was that it, it opened up this idea of not how, not how smart are you, but how are you smart? It allowed so many, it allowed everybody the chance to succeed and excel and feel good and thrive and blossom, not just the narrow little band that we've, that we've sort of reverted back to. So, so what, what I've discovered by, by sort of conversations with Square Pegs and the, and the sort of the, the network of people that we've sort of collaborated, we're collaborating with now is fantastic stuff that's going on just around the edges that schools would benefit from knowing about. Uh, uh, and so we're putting forward a, a bit like the working class book, this sort of collaborative book, which we'll call Square Pegs. Um, and the organization of sort of the coalition, which we're calling School Differently is, is, is to say, to, to all those teachers and head teachers working within the mainstream system who know that they just want to do so much more, but they don't know where to start or what to do or feel their hands are tied or, 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 or don't know what the alternatives are. Look, so here's good practice. Here's something you can do. Here's something you can speak to. Here's an organisation doing it. Here's another way of looking at things. Here's a way of bringing these in. Here's a way of understanding school refusal, for example, or mental health needs or, or, or um, democratic approaches to education or the Brighton College you mentioned earlier that, that actually you don't have to impose and force children to do things. Actually, it's done the right way. Children will choose to do the right things quite often anyway, regardless of what you, what you might think that, to quote 
to, to quote a private conversation of somebody for high up in Ofsted, children from poor backgrounds can't uh, make decisions because their lives are so chaotic, they can't make decisions for themselves. That's the mindset, that's the mentality that we can we can challenge, we can change, because it isn't necessarily the case for every child from a, from a poorer background. So we've got this coalition, if you like, um, because lots of people do lots of disparate things. Let's, let's try and have a, a bit of a united voice, even though we were saying different things. To, to show a bit like we did with um, the working class book, the alternative narrative around how education could be, how schooling could be, how working with children with special needs and school refusers could be, how understanding the neuroscience, understanding examples of good practice when it comes to understanding how to get the best out of children who are who are struggling within the education, who are the square pegs in the round holes. That's That's the work we're coming on there and just... Um, it's really exciting. We hope to have a book out in time for the United Nations Day of the Child, I think it is in November, because this issue is linked to children's rights. And, and while there is an obligation to pursue children's rights in schools in this country, and there are some rights respecting schools out there, it, it's easy to, to not think about education that sort of way and to have education something we do to children, whether they, whether they want it or not, that they have no right to to argue with the education that we're doing to them. So it, it opens up those sorts of debates as well, which is really interesting. Mm. Well, we've got so many overlapping interests. It's ridiculous. Um, th that sounds amazing. And I would really love to uh, to get involved in that in any way that I can. Where can people find out about School Differently? So the um, I think we've got the website schooldifferently.org. Dot UK is out there now and we're sort of just starting to put together the debate we start off with five premises about what education is about what education is we need to have the conversation about what what is what is the question we want education to answer mm. so we're starting off the debate with I know you've seen those James because you sort of commented on those just, yeah. just to open up the debate about it, as opposed to not thinking about it and then just thinking education is measured by exams therefore the better the exam results the better the education and it, it's much more complex and, and rich than that and, and there are spaces on that to on that website to sort of interact and act, you know just to, to to comment about those questions and join that that community if you like. Uh, the book will come out, um, or just I mean come to independentthinking.co.uk or .com and 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 see what we're doing there and interact with me there. Or Ian at independentthinking.co.uk drop me a line there. Or Twitter, I tend to run the ITL Independent Thinking Twitter account. So at ITL Worldwide, I'm more than happy to to react and interact and direct message there. Um, uh, and just the, the more conversation, nice, the more nice, you don't have to agree with me, but the more nice conversations we can have, um, the better. Nice, nice guys finish nice. I like it. Yeah. Um, well, I'll, I should let you go and uh, and have your meeting about uh, your the, the TV programme. And I need to go and find a dark room where I can think about the fly and the train because that's going to just wreck my head for a few weeks i think it has an um, effect it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you ian and you thank you thank you for having me it's been great it's i was never sure about a long podcast it's like the long read it's like in a world of instant fixes whether people whether you'd have enough to talk about but these two and a three and a quarter hours have gone really really fast which is why i've now overlapped with my next meeting so you you're, you're yeah the power of your the power of your questions and your insights are really useful in facilitating these discussions so thank you for having me along and well done to you time is a measure of change we don't have much time time is a measure